Welcome our invited guests and others that are joining us on the line on behalf of the National Academies and the committee. We wanna thank you for joining and participating in our open information gathering meeting. Um, we'll start with some introductions uh, and then get underway with some housekeeping items and um, then our presentation. But for the moment, I will turn it over to our committee chair, Tom Miller, for um, any initial remarks and to get us underway with introductions. Thank you, Stacy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to what is now the third meeting of a consensus committee of the National Academies looking at the um, distribution of primary benefits in fisheries. Uh, and we are being tasked with trying to determine um, what data and information are required to assess whether the distribution of those primary benefits is e equitable or not. Um, this is a consensus committee that has been um, motivated by the interests of NOAA itself. Uh, often academy committees are mandated through Congress, but this is one in which the agency has come to the National Academies to request uh, the Academies advice and input as it seeks to implement um, recent executive orders surrounding uh, environmental ju 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 justice. And so I think the agency deserves considerable credit for that. Um, we're going to uh, hear today from a number of regional administrators uh, or from the regional office about their thoughts regarding um, information uh, and data that are available to help them uh, to determine whether those benefits are distributed in an e equitable fashion. Um, the committee is a, a very diverse uh, group based both in terms of their own disciplinary interests and geographically it's been put together thoughtfully to try and, and provide uh, a broad perspective of, of these questions. And so we're going to start by uh, asking the committee members to very briefly provide an in introduction and then we will move on to some housekeeping issues. So to start the ball rolling, my name is Tom Miller. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. I'm located at the Chesapeake Biological Lab, which is about 50 miles south and east of Washington, D.C., on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay. And my um, training is in fisheries. Uh, I do a lot of uh, stock assessment and other modeling work related directly to, to fishery management. Um, I'm going to go around in, in order that I have people on the committee. So uh, next in alphabetical order, Lisa Campbell. Lisa. Sure. Hi, I'm Lisa Campbell. I'm a professor at the Nicholas School of Environment at Duke University, and I'm based at the Marine Lab in Beaufort, North Carolina. Uh, I'm a social scientist broadly interested in oceans governance questions, including questions around fisheries and um, equity and access. Um, and I'm a member of the Ocean Studies Board as well at the moment. So I think that's it for me. Thank you, Lisa. Rachel, Rachel Donkersloot. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Donkersloot. My background's in anthropology and I live and work in rural Alaska, and a lot of my research and uh, applied projects focus on um, the community and cultural impacts of um, resource governance and re uh, fishery management systems and, and decision making. And a lot of my current work is looking at um, um, how to how to identify and measure and include dimensions of well-being and decision making. Happy to be here. Thank you, Rachel. Kaylin, go next. Great. Uh, so I'm Kaylin Kretz. I'm an assistant professor of environmental and resource economics at Arizona State University. And here I'm in the School of Sustainability. 
A lot of my research has been Alaska-based, and I currently serve on the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, SSC. Thank you, Kaylin. Uh, Grant Murray, please. Yeah, hi, everybody. I'm Grant Murray. I'm a marine social scientist, associate professor at the Duke University Marine Lab on the Outer Banks of North Carolina, uh, broadly interested in, in how communities work and how they interact with the environment. Um, I think a lot about values and well-being um, in terms of the impacts they receive from fisheries management and other interventions. Also looking forward to the meeting. Thank you, Grant. Um, also on the committee, but not able to join us today is Matthew Weber, who's an associate professor uh, in resource economics at UC da 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 Davis. Um, next on my list is one of Matthew's <laughs> colleagues. Yeah. Sorry, I think Matt, Matt was actually able to join the open. Oh, he session, is? So I think we've oh. got him on here. Matthew, I apologize. That's okay. It's not the first time that's happened. Go ahead, Matt, uh, if you'd like to add anything to the introduction. Yeah, uh, perfectly captured. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. I, I will learn to take my foot out of my mouth next time I uh, uh, open it. My apologies. Uh, Jim, you're next. Here, uh, Jim St. Carico, I'm a professor at the University of California at Davis. I'm a natural resource economist by training. I work on the design and evaluation of natural resource management policies, including fisheries. I am also a member of the Ocean Studies Board and currently chairing a standing committee of the National Academies on Offshore Wind and Fisheries. Thank you, Jim. Stephen. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephen Cyphers. I'm an associate professor at the University of South Alabama um, in the School of Marine and Environmental Sciences and also in sociology. My research is, is kind of integrating those two fields, and we do a lot of work with human dimensions of fisheries, uh, primarily in the Gulf of Mexico, where I also serve on the Gulf Council's SSC and Ecosystem Technical Committee, and I am also serving on the, the Fisheries and Wind Committee that Jim is chairing. So thank y'all for coming. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Rashid. Yeah, hello, everybody. I'm Rashid Sumaila, a professor at the University of British Columbia. I'm an economist by training. I, these days, I call myself as an interdisciplinary oceans and fisheries economist. Uh, anything connected to the ocean and economics, you will find me there. There's a broad range of things. So. Yeah, thank you, and uh, that's me. Thank you, Rishi. Um, we have a great team staffing the committee, and I'll start by asking Stacy to introduce herself. Thank you, Tom. Stacy Karras, I'm a senior program officer with the National Academies. I've been with the Ocean Studies Board since 2012, um, and in this role for probably approximately the last five years. Um, I'm really looking forward to staffing this committee. Uh, those that know the Academy as well know that the staff is expected to serve as generalists, um, staffing projects on a variety of topics, um, but fisheries is part of my background interest. So um, these topics in particular are, are pretty near and dear to me and I'm really excited uh, and fascinated by this particular topic. So um, looking forward to serving as the study director for this study. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, Leanne. Hi, I'm Leanne, and I am a research associate um, fairly new to the Ocean Studies Board. Thank you, Leanne. And last, Eric. Hi, everyone. My name is Eric Yanisco. I'm a program assistant on the Ocean Studies Board and on the study team. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll ask um, the presenters to introduce themselves when they um, when they when their agenda item comes up. Um, and I'm going to turn the um, microphone back to Stacey for some housekeeping. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I will try to keep this fairly short and painless, but the first thing I wanted to just make note of is that this is an open public session of the committee. 
Uh, we will be recording this session. Uh, hopefully you all saw a, a disclaimer when you logged into the Zoom, um, but this will be recorded and uh, the information gathered is for the purposes of the committee deliberations that follow in closed session. Uh, for the purposes of moderating the discussion today, I'd like folks to, to please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Uh, that way we know who to call on. We will likely prioritize questions and comments from the committee, uh, but certainly welcome questions and comments from others also as time allows. Um, I will just ask folks to please remain muted unless they've been called upon to speak. It looks like so far folks have been doing a really nice job of that and staff will try to assist um, as well as needed, but thank you for trying to make an effort to remain muted when not speaking. If you have any technical questions or need any technical assistance with Zoom, uh, please don't hesitate to message either Leanne Martin or Eric Yanisco, both of whom are on the line with us today. And um, to that point, I welcome folks to use the chat feature. It's a great way to exchange information, provide links, uh, et cetera, but uh, I typically do not monitor the chat for the purposes of including feedback into the conversation. So really want this to be a conversation and hope that folks will participate. Um, but just please know that uh, I will not be monitoring the chat for that purpose. Um, see, I think that pretty much covers my housekeeping items. As Tom said, this is the third information gathering meeting of this committee. Um, we uh, certainly can have more, but we will expect to have at least one um, in-person meeting. I think the committee has landed uh, on that likely being in July, in um, at least tentatively in the DC area, unless we determine that we have reason to meet elsewhere. So, um, you know, please follow our website and don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions about future meetings of this committee as well. Tom, I think with that, I can turn it back to you. Thank you, Stacey. Um, we are delighted today to welcome representatives from each of the regional um, fishery offices around the, the nation. And we've invited uh, these uh, people in for a specific reason. Uh, as I mentioned in my introductory comments, we are tasked with uh, determine, determining the categories of information required to adequately assess where and to whom the primary benefits of commercial and for hire fishery management accrue. And it is the regional administrators that largely are at the sharp end of that process. They are the people who, in consultation with the councils, work to uh, make allocation decisions, permit decisions, license decisions. And so the committee thought it was appropriate to hear from each of the regions. We gave each of the regional administrators a series of questions, um, not that we will specifically stick to those very questions, but we wanted them to give, uh, to give them an idea of the kinds of things we're going to be interested in so that they can be as prepared as possible um, for the um, for the questions that we ask. Uh, we're going to start uh, with each one asking them to describe a little bit about the commercial and for hire questions in their re regions, and then we will um, start going through a series of, of questions um, from the committee seeking follow up and, and guidance uh, as we go through um, our questions. Um, as you can imagine, these uh, men and women are from all across the United States, spanning multiple time zones. Uh, these are often people whose, whose um, sh schedules are very busy, so we're going to be uh, constrained, certainly in, in time, um, and so we'll understand that as we go forward. But our um, first guest today is Mike Pentany, who is the regional administrator of the Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office. Uh, 
he is the regional administrator for the region that, that on which I serve on the SSC for the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council and for the Northeast uh, Fishery Management Council. Um, so uh, Mike, uh, welcome to the committee. And um, I'm going to start by asking you to provide a, a little bit of introduction of yourself and to the region, paying particular attention to a broad description of the sort of commercial and for hire fisheries that, that occur in the Northeast. Mike, welcome. All right. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Am I coming through OK? You are. Great. Um, so I don't know if it's possible to share my screen. Is that technically feasible? All right, I'm actually on twice. So I'm gonna, there's one of my personas is Mike Pentney. I'm gonna share that screen and see if that works. Excellent, thank you. And yes, Eric, um, if you could just ensure that it's, that um, the sharing screen is enabled, that'd be great. Okay. So that seems to be working, which is great. Um, so I just thought I'd provide a little bit of context um, to answer some of the questions. And then probably if we have a half hour, I can probably talk for you know 10 minutes and then uh, open it up to questions because I'm sure I won't be able to address everything that you're interested in uh, in a brief introduction. Um, but as Tom said, I'm Mike Pentney, Regional Administrator for Greater Atlantic uh, Regional Fisheries Office. Um, used to be known as the Northeast Regional Office uh, until we had a name change a number of years ago. Um, I've been in this position for a little over five years, but I've been with NOAA Fisheries in our region uh, since 2002, uh, and so 21 years. And before that, I was a staff member on the New England Fishery Management Council. So I got to know the Fishery Management Council process quite well from the inside. Uh, before I transitioned over to uh, to NOAA Fisheries. And although as regional administrator, my work spans, um, you know, the full spectrum of, uh, of our interests and mandates under uh, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, of course, uh, Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, and our grant programs, Essential Fish Habitat, um, a number of, of activities, uh, most of my career, uh, up until I became regional administrator, actually, uh, was on the fisheries side of the house. So uh, fisheries is where I, I uh, have most of my experience and uh, issues like North Atlantic right whales and uh, wind and habitat and uh, Endangered Species Act recovery uh, actions are all actually relatively new to me since I transitioned into this position. So happy to talk about our fisheries and, uh, and then answer any questions. So just um, to provide a little bit of geographic context, uh, this is our region. Um, I'm gonna move this out of the way if I can. There we go, that's better. Um, this is our, our region at large um, and technically according to the way NOAA Fisheries uh, allocates our, our regions, uh, the Greater Atlantic region includes the Great Lakes um, although almost all of the work that we do related to the Great Lakes is in sort of grants, uh, mostly pass through uh, grants that we get direction from, from Congress and the appropriations. There is some enforcement work uh, that our enforcement team does, but uh, by and large, when we're talking about fisheries management, uh, we are talking about offshore fisheries uh, from the states, uh, you know, spanning from the states of Maine through uh, generally Cape Hatteras, North Carolina is, is what we consider our our general range of jurisdiction, although there are a couple of stocks where, where that's a little bit different. Um, as many of you know, given your familiarity with the process, um, we work with fishery management councils under the Magnuson Act. So in, uh, in our region, our most important partners are the New England Fishery Management Council, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council, as Tom said, um, and then also the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is comprised of the states of, of Maine through Florida, um, although we work primarily with the states of North Carolina, um, north through Maine. Um, and then just as a real quick snapshot for reference, um, we have a number of important fisheries in our region. 
uh, on the commercial side, uh, the highest value fisheries in uh, on the East Coast are sea scallops and American lobster, um, but also very important economically um, across the, the region are our ground fish, uh, is our ground fish fishery, uh, the squid fisheries, surf clams and ocean quahogs, uh, summer flounder, black sea bass, and scup. And then on the recreational side, um, both for hire and private anglers, as well as shoreside anglers, um, are fisheries for summer flounder, black sea bass, scup, um, bluefish, uh, and ground fish are also uh, are really important. And you know, when I say important, it's sort of the the number of angler trips, the the amount of landings, and the amount of time and attention that we that we uh, spend uh, on the management process, and then as well as value, you know, commercial value. Um, and, and, and recreational interest and value as well. So just to note, um, you know, related to uh, these fisheries, uh, particularly related to the question about uh, equity and, and benefits that are derived from, uh, from the fisheries, I think it's important to, at least on the commercial side, um, to recognize that all of the fisheries that I've listed here and most of our other fisheries, because this isn't an exclusive list by any means, but these are the most important. Um, all of these fisheries are, are managed under limited access programs. And so that, uh, you know, as, as I'm sure you're well aware, uh, limited access programs established uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago, um, in some cases, uh, ITQ fisheries, individual transferable quota fisheries, surf clams, and ocean quahogs was one of the first in the country. Uh, back goes back to the early 90s. Uh, the permit structures, the permit systems that we have for uh, for vessels to be engaged in those fisheries uh, are pretty much locked up uh, in the the uh, the legacy permit holders, uh, and those permits do transfer um, through the sale of a vessel. Uh, from one entity to another entity, um, but by and large, the limit, the, the limited access uh, fisheries, and the benefits, the, the most direct benefits of those of, of access to those fishing opportunities uh, are fairly constrained. And so, when we think about equity, um, it's it's a bit of a challenging thing for us to work through. I think, in part, because uh, there's not a lot of opportunity for new entrants. There's not a lot of opportunity for uh, people not previously engaged in fisheries um, or in, in these fisheries uh, to get directly involved through access to a, a, a permit uh, unless they have the capital. And uh, permits themselves, we talk about selling and transferring permits. Uh, the permits themselves aren't actually uh, sold. Uh, it's the vessel that's that's sold, uh, but it's the, the permits are attached to a vessel. And so in some cases, you know, it's a fully fledged fishing vessel uh, that is sold or transferred to a new owner uh, with the full suite of permits associated with that. Um, the workaround that the industry has found to our permit uh, sale restrictions uh, is often to transfer a suite of permits from a fishing vessel uh, onto a small skiff, uh, sell the skiff uh, with those permits to a new owner. Uh, and then some cases the and then the new owner will transfer those permits off the skiff uh, and put them back on, put them onto the fishing vessel that that they may already own. Most of our limited access permits uh, are bundled together, uh, regardless of how they were they came to be. So if someone has a uh, you know qualified with their fishing vessel for a uh, a ground fish permit back in the day, uh, say in the early '90s. Uh, and they also qualified for a squid permit based on their history in that fishery. Uh, and maybe they have, they qualified for a summer flounder uh, and or a black sea bass permit uh, back when those uh, fisheries went to moratorium permits. Then, uh, then those permits are all now linked into a permit bundle uh, and they cannot be split apart. So in order for uh, one of those permits to be sold or transferred to a new entrant, new, ent uh, new vessel, uh, the entire suite of permits. Uh, would have to be would have to move. Uh, that creates obviously some some all, some similar challenges with new entrants and 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 equity in terms of the amount of capital required uh, because you know the opportunity to access those valuable fisheries obviously comes at a cost. On the recreational side, uh, it's a diff very different story. Uh, we don't have any limited access permit structures uh, for most 
private anglers, uh, you know, it's simply open access. Uh, but even on the for hire side where we do issue permits to for hire charter and party vessels, uh, those are all currently open access. And so we do see, uh, you know, rising and falling numbers of permits uh, issued each year uh, for the opportunity to participate in those fisheries. So in terms of equity uh, on the for hire side, I think there is more opportunity to pursue that uh, because those permits are open access. Uh, just real quick, uh, in terms of primary data sources, uh, you know, largely when we think about equity and the socioeconomics of a fishery, we're talking about uh, our fishery dependent data. Uh, we have basically five sort of varieties of, of uh, data sources that we can, from which we can uh, glean information about the participants in our fishery. Uh, the vessel permit applications uh, have important information in terms of ownership. Uh, the structure of a company, the structure of, uh, of the entities that are involved. Uh, and, and in some cases, uh, you know, it might be one company that has uh, several uh, sub companies that each own a vessel. Uh, in other cases, there are various partnerships that rise and fall um, in terms of those vessel permit applications. And all of that ownership information is provided on the vessel permit application. Uh, and then for every fishing trip, uh, commercial in particular, commercial fishing trip that is that occurs, uh, there should be an associated fishing vessel trip report. Uh, that uh, is a source primarily of data about the fishing trip itself. Uh, when did it depart? Where did it go uh, in broad terms? When did it land? Uh, what was caught? What was discarded? Um, how many sets or toes did a vessel uh, did a vessel make? Seafood dealer reports is our primary source for um, landings data, uh, the verified landings data, uh, the, the, the uh, use of that fish, where did it go? Was it used for food? Was it sold for bait? Um, was, uh, what was the price paid per pound to the vessel? So we get our ex vessel revenue sources from the seafood dealer. So all of our revenue uh, and value information comes from these seafood dealer reports. And then uh, the four hired vessel trip reports, so our permitted four hire captains, those vessels, they are required to submit vessel trip reports as well for all of their four hire trips, be it for uh, party or charter vessels. Uh, and they generally provide information on the number of passengers. Uh, again, where, where did the trip occur? Or what were the primary target species? Uh, that sort of information. And then the last uh, sort, which is semi-independent, but it is, uh, it is data that's on the fishing activity is our observer report. So we do have a, a quite robust uh, fisheries observer program out of run out of our Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Uh, and they're providing, uh, they put observers uh, on vessels, a certain percentage of, of trips each year uh, across the spectrum of our, of our permitted uh, managed fisheries. Uh, and the observers primarily are uh, collecting information about discards, uh, to validate, uh, you know, what what bycatch is occurring on the trips, uh, but they are also able to provide um, sort of higher resolution information on fishing activity uh, versus the broad um, broad uh, strokes uh, that are that are normally provided on a vessel trip report. Um, the last thing I didn't mention, which I didn't include here, uh, because it's sort of a, a, a an interesting mix between fishery dependent data and, and independent. Uh, but it's not really independent, would be our study fleet, which is a sm very small subset of our commercial vessels um, that agree to participate with the Science Center in a study fleet. Uh, they provide basically haul-by-haul -haul data on fishing effort and catch. So there's nothing necessarily, uh, you know, on the socioeconomic side, uh, but there is an opportunity there uh, because of being a participant in the study fleet, they are, uh, you know, a source we can go to for uh, for more data and, and higher resolution data. So that's uh, primarily what I wanted to, to sketch out in broad strokes and um, see maybe, Tom, if it's okay at this point, if there are any initial questions or, or any additional prompts that you'd uh, like me to cover, we can, we can take it from there. And I'll stop sharing my screen, screen unless there's a specific question that, that somebody would like to point to. Thank you very much, Mike. I think you sort of touched on on the topics that we asked you to. I, I'll start a question by 
just yeah, I wonder if you could give me an idea of the frequency of these transfers of these permitted bump. Um, I think you know I, I don't have a number off the top of my hand, although I can certainly um, get you a you know a, a, a monthly average or something. Um, but we do have a you know we have a team uh, in our office um, that that's their primary job is handling permit transfers. And so um, there's a lot of, of activity each fishing year in terms of, of vessels coming in and out of, of activity, uh, vessels going into, we have, a, we have a category for our permits called confirmation of permit history or CPH, uh, kind of an arcane term, but basically it means that uh, the permit bundles are not currently associated with a vessel. Um, but that the 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 owner of the the permit of uh, holder of that permit uh, is retaining their rights uh, to uh, put those permits back on a vessel if and when um, they choose to do so, and it allows us to get around some of our regulations, which state that a you know a permit has to be on a boat um, in order to be repermitted and and remain eligible the following year. And it also allows for our fisheries um, that are primarily a quota base where, where quotas are transferable. So our Northeast groundfish fishery is the best example in our sector system. Um, that's uh, permit holders that, um, that choose to be sort of lease only can put their vessel permits in this uh, category of, of CPH. And then they have access to the quota associated with those permits um, to then lease out to other uh, permit holders that are that are fishing actively. And so those transfers uh, happen quite a bit um, between, uh, you know, a single owner might might move permits in and out of CPH based on on what they want to fish each year. Uh, and then also uh, they might transfer permits um, um, across vessels uh, or be uh, be selling or, or purchasing additional permits. All right, thank you. Uh, Grant, questions? Yeah, just um, additional clarification. Thank you very much for that. I found that very, very helpful. Um, can you say a little bit more about what information you have about, or, or as part of the uh, vessel permit applications about the owners? Do we know much beyond their corporate structure, for example, about who owns them, any demographic information about that? Like what, what level of detail do you have about that ownership? It's not terribly uh, detailed. It's primarily, uh, you know, what is the, you know, who are the officers in the, in the corporation? Um, but we're not, um, we didn't used to ask uh, even what percentage of the corporation they own. I believe we're now asking uh, what percentage in order to, um, to, to do some more deeper dives into the entity structure um, around our, our permits. But there's not a lot of demographic information, if any, on there. It's basically name, address, uh, contact information, and, uh, you know, corporate structure, if, if there is one, if there is, a, if there is a corporate structure. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Do you have sort of blank versions of that that we could see? Blank, yeah. On, on our webpage, we can point you to that. So you could, yeah. you could download all of our forms. Okay. They're available. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Uh, Jim, you're up next. Sure, thanks. Um, so can you elaborate a little bit about why the permits have been bundled and you can't break them up? I mean, that seems interesting. It is. It is interesting. Uh, it's a good question. And it's something that we've been thinking about um, more and more as we deal with climate change and how our stocks and therefore fisheries might be shifting into the future. Uh, in terms of what stocks may or may not be available, may not be the same stocks that were available 20 years ago. The, the fundamental reason why those permits were bundled had to do with an effort, uh, sort of capacity control. Um, if you can envision one vessel, um, you know, actively fishing, say during the 90s, when a lot of these fisheries went limited access, um, they fished for ground fish, they fished for, fished for scallops, they fished for monkfish, they did some black sea bass fishing when that was good. Maybe they did some squid fishing in the winter. Uh, and so they ended up, a single vessel would qualify for a suite of permits, um, allowing those permits then to be split off 
could theoretically turn the activities of one fishing vessel into five fishing vessels and depending on the bundles. And when you look at the capacity controls over the fisheries, um, you know, a portfolio of fishing opportunity that a vessel might engage in, uh, they might fish for squid, uh, you know, one time of year, ground fish another time of year, monkfish another time of year. Well, now you've, if you've turned that suite of permits from one vessel, each fish, you know, fishing each fishery for a couple of months, now you've got five vessels fishing full time uh, in those respective fisheries. And so the threat or concern about that capacity change uh, and the capacity of the fleet um, to expand if permits were, were those permit bundles were split off, um, that was the, the root cause of those rules about saying that, that once permits are bundled in a suite, they cannot be split apart. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Rashid, your hand is next. Yeah. yeah, Mike, thank you. Thank you. Very useful presentation. It's short to the point, I mean, <laughs> in my view. And as you made it clear, uh, what I got from your presentation is that dealing with uh, equity issues will be different depending on whether it's recreational fisheries, which is open access, which has no permits. So, maybe there's more latitude there to play around. Uh, at the same time is the sector that is usually dominated by well-to-do people, right? I mean, so when you talk about <laughs> groups that are that are not that rich and so on, how they participate in there. So that's a separate thing. And then the commercial is where we have this legacy, we have the permits, difficult to play around that, right? In terms of really so, so for the committee, this is, these are probably two things we will have to watch and see how, how we could contribute uh, to, to, through this work, yeah. So thank you for that. And I'm, I'm wondering whether, and this is close to what Grant said, you know, how much information can you, of the legacy ownership, can we learn about? And how does that mirror in the population you know, in a given fishing area, so no. Yeah, I agree. I think I think that is a challenge, and it's something that um, you know we have um, a team of social scientists at our Northeast Fishery Science Center, um, yeah. economists, and other social scientists that are are looking into some of these issues. And uh, I know, and this isn't I know directly within your your uh, your mandate, um, but looking at crew. And looking at the sort of trying to get at some of the, de the demographics and a better understanding of uh, the crew that are working on these vessels. Uh, so we, you know, while we have some limited information about the demographics of our uh, of our owners, our permit holders, yes. vessel owners, um, we have even less information in general about the crew. Um, and you know, I think, and so mostly, I think what you know we get on the vessel trip reports might be the number of crew. Um, and so our science center is exploring and they've done a, they've done a crew survey and they're trying to do another crew survey uh, to get more information about our crew. Now that may not be directly responsive to, um, to what you've been asked by our agency. Um, but as you know, as many of you know, uh, you know, a traditional path from uh, to ownership uh, is, is for fishermen to start working as a crew, crewman on a boat. Uh, and and work their way up um, to to be a captain, and then eventually, um, you know, once they have the capital and the wherewithal to to get their own boat. And so, I think having some information about crew, uh, at least from the agency's perspective, uh, is important to see how those um, kind of how those track and 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 to learn more about the demographics of our crew and and hopefully future future captains and and vessel owners. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike. Matthew. Yeah, thanks. I, and I think you might have actually covered uh, a bunch of my question. Uh, what I was going to ask is if there was information on crew or more generally, to what extent is there kind of vessel and permit owner um, kind of absentee um, sort of fishing in the sense that like, 
you know, mm-hmm. you've got vessel owners, permit owners that actually aren't doing the fishing and it's really just for higher crew and captains. Right. Um, there might be, there's probably not like a direct source of information where we could go to that, for, to, to find that. Uh, we don't have any uh, operator on board or owner on board um, requirements in any of our fisheries. Um, so it's not something that we would directly track. Um, we do issue operator permits. And so the master of a fishing vessel uh, for every trip has to has to have an operator permit. So one could theoretically, uh, you know, do a, a cross comparison of our uh, of the operator permits we issue each year against the uh, the vessel permits that we issue each year, and look for look mm-hmm. for matches. Um, but in general, um, you know we have we have a variety of fisheries right in in in, st- in structure corporate structures in the Northeast. We have companies like Blue Harvest out of out of New Bedford that you've probably heard about. Um, they're uh, you know pro- funded by a private equity firm. Um, they own a fleet of groundfish vessels. Uh, so the company is clearly, you know, hiring captains as well as crew to operate those vessels. We have a number of owner operators um, that, you know, either single hand their boat or have a small crew that they work with. And, uh, you know, that can be, uh, to some degree, that probably can be, can be discerned through looking at the permit owner database and seeing, um, you know, ownership of, in the name of an individual uh, and, and that's the, and they own one boat. Um, and then there are other, uh, you know, uh, companies that Atlantic Capes would be another one that comes to mind out of, out of Southern New Jersey, um, Lund's Fisheries, uh, you know, which are true fishing corporations and they own fleets of vessels and, and, um, and hire their, their captains and, and crew. Mm. If I could just follow up quickly on, on that, um, you also mentioned in terms of the demographic information that you had on the permit and vessel owner registrations that you had an address. And I was wondering if that address is considered to be a residence or whether that's like a home port for the vessel. I would have to double check on that. I think we do ask for, um, we ask for home port, um, but I believe at least in terms of the permit application, we need an actual physical address. Uh, and, and this dates back to, you know, the dark ages where every time we, we issued a regulatory change, uh, everything went hard copy in the mail. And so our permit holder letters, which were, you know, we would inundate some of our permit holders with, with, uh, with uh, mail from us. And so, you know, our databases include, you know, uh, mailing addresses for all of our, our owners. Uh, so that we can, you know, at least uh, traditionally, uh, have mailed you know mailed them uh, their their permit renewal forms, their vessel trip reports. Uh, you know everything was hard copy uh, just until a few years ago, as we started to transition online. All right, gonna, thank you. I'm going to give one last question to Ra- Ra- Rachel, given the time. Um, okay. All right, so Rachel, one last question. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about um, what do you think for your region, what are the main challenges to collecting data and using data related to equity issues? I think, you know, we're, we're working through equity now, obviously you got the briefing from headquarters. There is a a tremendous amount of attention uh, from the administration through the agency uh, around equity and environmental justice. I think one of the biggest challenges are understanding who our communities are um, that may be invested in our fisheries that we don't necessarily recognize because they're not the main players. Um, those of you that are, you know, f- in- involved in fishery management councils know that or probably have experienced where the number of people that actually show up and participate in the process, either at the committee level or the, the full council level, is a fairly constrained few that are heavily engaged either because they are they want to be as 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 business owners or they're hired to be and so when you can when you contrast the number of people that say show up to and participate in council meetings actively 
with the number of permit holders, the permits that we issue, orders of magnitude difference. And so uh, it's entirely possible that there are communities of, of fishermen, crew, permit holders, other communities that are engaged in uh, on the support side of our fishing industry that we don't recognize because we're un you know, simply unaware. Um, they don't participate actively and maybe they don't participate actively because we're not connecting with them. We're not making them aware of these opportunities. And so from, from my perspective, our biggest challenge right now is on the identification of our fishing communities and, and particularly the underserved uh, communities so that we can begin to assess what services are they currently getting? What services would they like? And how can we better provide those services? And, and just a quick follow-up, is it in collecting that data, is it capacity issues right now? Is it confidentiality concerns? Like what's, what are some of the barriers to, to, to getting a better handle on that data? I think it's primarily capacity. Um, you know, we, we don't have anybody who has trained in, in the regional office. We don't have anybody who has training in, um, you know, direct social science training. We have some people who, you know, probably got an undergraduate degree in economics, but they've been, they're not practicing economists um, or social scientists. And, and so we don't really have the, the structure in the organization, the organizational structure to focus on, uh, on that as a priority. And so we do rely a lot of uh, on our social our Northeast Fishery Science Center staff, the social sciences branch there, uh, to work with us on this. Uh, but again, it's a small team um, that are trying with a lot of work. They're supporting you know all of our activities, um, um, you know, and and I'm sure they don't have the capacity that they would like uh, to put the kind of focus or attention that they would like to on a lot of these issues. And I know we're out of time um, now, so I appreciate all your questions. Uh, I'm happy to answer any more questions, Tom, if, if you need a follow-up call or uh, can want to uh, send me an email with some questions and I can get some more detailed responses uh, and links to, to any of uh, the additional supporting information that you'd like. Well, Mike, we certainly appreciate your time and, and your candor and, and your responses today. Um, I think as we become more e e educated on the questions, I suspect we might darken your door again uh, at some point. So um, we really appreciate your time. You're, of course, welcome to stay around and hear from your colleagues across the, the region. We have a time slot at the end for a sort of panel di discussion. Um, but um, greatly appreciate your time today and, and the thoughts that you shared with, with us. So, Mike, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, Welcome to. Um, I I will be on. I'll I'll try to stay around for another half hour, but I will have to bow out before the uh, the overall Q and A at the end. So I apologize for that. Not not a worry. But we appreciate your time. So um, we're going to jump geographically from one side of the nation to the other. Uh, it's now my pleasure to uh, welcome Frank Lockhart um, to the committee. Um, Frank is the branch chief for the ground fish and coastal pelagic species branch uh, for the West Coast Regional Office here representing uh, the, the West Coast. Frank. So, um, yes, my name is Frank Lockhart. I'm actually senior policy advisor. Uh, that title, I don't know how that made it in there. Uh, I am not the branch chief for the ground fish and coastal pelagic species. Um, but in, in, in any case, uh, it, it got into a database at one point in time, and I'm having a double of a time getting it deleted from that database. So apologize <laughs> for that. So, uh, but, wonderful. Yes, exactly. So uh, but I am senior policy advisor, uh, and uh, I've uh, I have been uh, in the region, uh, West Coast region, since 2005. Prior to that, I had kind of a varied career. I was a biologist and um, started started off doing that, and then I worked for the uh, uh, House of Representatives for the now defunct Merchant Marine and Fisheries Committee, which did Magnuson and ESA and marine mammal work. Then I worked for Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, uh, and then I went to the agency, And but then I did a detail where I ended up working for the Senate um, Commerce uh, Committee. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then actually, um, 
ended up working for the, uh, went on another detail to the um, U.S. Ocean Commission and was was one of the staff on that. And actually, uh, Dr. Sancherico was one of my sources for information there. So <laughs> I worked with him and uh, his office was just a block and a half away from, from me there in, in D.C. So I don't know if he recalls that, but I certainly recall him. And then I did go to the region and, and there, when I came to the region, I was the assistant regional administrator. And so I was there for the transition of the ground fish uh, fishery from a limited entry to the catch shares program. And I also managed uh, uh, salmon. Now, as senior policy advisor, I still sit on the council, but for a limited number of things. Um, and uh, like for halibut, and, and I do sit on for some coastal pelagic species and the ecosystem work and and habitat. And, and given my background, I fill in for people that have uh, scheduling conflicts. So I, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll do a little bit of everything for, for the region. Uh, uh, Jen Kwan uh, did try to make this, but as you know, she was just hired as a regional administrator. And uh, uh, depending on your analogy, uh, she's either drinking from the fire hose or uh, on the steep end of the learning curve. And so she had she had uh, a thing that she could not get out of, and she she does apologize. So I am going to try to share my screen now uh, with a very short uh, presentation. Uh, and... Let's see. Oops, started off on the wrong one. Um, so uh, just obviously we're the West, West Coast region, and um, I've already gone over all, all of that. Um, and uh, the map shows the, the main states we have. For the region itself, we have offices in these four states. We're one of the most geographically diverse regions um, in the country. Um, uh, a lot of the diversity is because of salmon, you know, we do manage salmon and they go uh, well in stream. Um, uh, not really shown on the map, but we also, uh, a lot of our uh, fishing entities fish off this coast and also go up to Alaska. And then some of the recreational, in particular recreational, will fish uh, in, in Mexico. Uh, and so we, we, if you look at kind of the region where <laughs> people from this coast fish in, it's, it's very, very broad. So um, uh, just to kind of a, I, I realize watching Mike's uh, presentation, we went in a different direction, but uh, here's the four uh, FMPs that we do. We have salmon and the fishery is, is from the US Canada border all the way down to mid California. It's highly constrained by ESA listed stocks um, um, and there's recreational fishermen and then small scale uh, commercial boats. Uh, importantly, this is a, an important tribal fishery as well, so we have to worry about uh, treaty trust responsibilities for this fishery. And then going on, coastal pelagic species. Um, these are things like sardines, anchovy, mackerel, squid. Uh, most of the effort is in southern Cal uh, southern and mid-California, uh, but it can be coastwide in some years. Um, the, they are fished primarily using pursanes. And there, there was a limited tribal fishery uh, that um, due to kind of uh, the overfish status of sardines and as well as uh, COVID, uh, that fishery has been kind of uh, on the back burner for, uh, for a few years. Groundfish, uh, groundfish is kind of the most, uh, I don't know, pervasive fishery. It's all over uh, a lot of different, it's the, it's the widest variety of fishing techniques and techniques and um, participants. It's over 90 species, things like uh, rockfish, a sole, uh, whiting, and sablefish. Whiting is a our only real industrial fishery similar to pollock. Uh, you need to have uh, very specialized gear and uh, also very specialized processing to, to do that. So it's the most industrial fishery and the highest volume fishery by far uh, on the coast. As I said, a wide variety of uh, participants, uh, uh, recreational of all shapes and sizes. And then we also have small, medium, and large scale commercial boats. Uh, and again, a lot of our trawlers um, participate in both uh, West Coast fisheries and, and go up to Alaska. Uh, our port of Seattle, and to a limited extent, some of the Oregon ports, if you go into those ports, some, some ports will have mostly Alaska fishing vessels in them. Uh, and uh, some will fish both. And again, here we have uh, tribal fisheries uh, for uh, halibut, 
and uh, whiting uh, and rockfish uh, that are an important part of our considerations. Uh, finally, we have a highly migratory species uh, FMP, again, coastwide, but more effort in California, uh, particularly recreationally. These are tunas, billfishers, uh, and sharks. There are protected species bycatch concerns. Um, and again, uh, there's recreational fishing and then small, medium scale commercial vessels. So uh, some other important considerations, not necessarily related to FMPs. Again, I just wanted to emphasize the tribal trust responsibility to treaty and federally recognized tribes. We have treaty tribes up in uh, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and then federally recognized tribes in California. Uh, that we have to um, uh, work with uh, on an annual basis in developing uh, our fishery management um, uh, policies. Uh, other things, we have several international treaties that impact our management. Uh, we have a um, we work with the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission on highly migratory species. Uh, we work with the International Pacific Halibut Com Commission for halibut fisheries, uh, and then there is a Pacific Hate slash whiting treaty um, uh, that we work with. Um, it, it doesn't have its own organization, but we work with uh, uh, through this treaty with Canada. And then finally, uh, Pacific Salmon Treaty uh, as well, that those negotiations impact our management. Um, one thing that uh, is different from uh, a lot of the other regions, a lot of all regions have endangered species concerns, but this is a driving factor for this coast. Most of the people in the region work on protected resources. Um, I would say probably two, at least two thirds of the region staff is, is working some way on um, uh, endangered species or protected species um, management. So uh, another important difference, uh, Mike mentioned that they do a lot of the data collecting. Here, the data collecting is shared. Uh, and even some of the permitting is shared between the states, the federal government, and Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. I didn't go into a whole lot of detail here. If you want that kind of detail, we can get it to it afterwards. Another thing is that we do have a fishery ecosystem plan, which was developed in part to look at cross-FMP issues, uh, such as climate change and coastal commit committees. There has been some equity discussions during these um, uh, agenda items. Um, then finally, uh, we do have strong working relationships with both of, of our science centers. There's a Southwest Science Center headquartered in La Jolla and a Northwest Science Center headquartered in Seattle. And then finally, we tried to, we looked, looked at the questions you provided and, and kind of went this way rather than the direction Mike went. And uh, But anyway, uh, so the, the questions you had, how are considerations of equity incorporated? Uh, and then what information could equity considerations rely on? And this was kind of a difficult question for us a, a, a little bit. Mike hit on it on his very last answer. You know, um, equity is hard to kind of define what that means and who is who needs to be part of equity uh, discussions. And, you know, um, so just like him, the identification is an important issue that we we think needs work on. So. Uh, to the, uh, however, uh, uh, I guess our, our response is that the council does provide an open, transparent process that's available to all participants. Mike mentioned the same thing. You know, how, are we getting everyone that needs to be part of that discussions? Probably not. Uh, but it is open. It is transparent. It is widely noticed uh, to the extent we can. Um, and uh, to the extent we do talk about equity, it is usually... Um, at the council process, during harvest specifications process, or during FMP amendment process, it can come up in other content uh, contexts. But those ones, there are usually some discussions of equity, um, and uh, the kind of the, the the documents that are used. Uh, I think this is kind of at the very broad level. We have NEPA documents, RIR, IRFA, and public comment. Uh, those things will talk about equity uh, to the extent we know. Um, and there are occasionally, it's not uncommon for the council to ask for specific data on issues related to equity, such as impacts on ports or certain vessel classes and things like that. Um, uh, some other kind of things related to this, um, we talked about, we don't know if ever we're serving everyone. Uh, there's a marine resource education program that is part of a lot of the councils and actually started in the Garfo region. Um, this is a program designed to teach people about the council process to let them better uh, 
participate in that. I am actually the regional lead for that. And we are, we have started over the last year, year and a half, recognizing this question and actively trying to, how do we reach out to communities um, that are underserved so that they can participate in the council process? It has been a challenge. It is a real challenge. And, you know, the, uh, you know, everybody who's not in the room, please raise your hand. You know, uh, it's, it's a difficult, you know, thing to kind of uh, approach. And so how do you, how do you find those communities that are underserved when you don't know who they are? Uh, and so we're working on trying to answer that. A couple of things unique, well, somewhat unique to our region in, in that um, potentially address new entrants and and could potentially address equity is that we do have a, a fairly substantial open access fishery in the ground fish FMP. It's not totally unregulated, but uh, it does allow for new entrants and they're all usually small vessels and the fishery does change somewhat every year. Uh, in addition, when the catch shares program came online, Part of that was a 10% set aside of the quota uh, of most uh, of everything except whiting uh, for an adaptive management program. The adaptive management program has many um, potential uses, but one of them is new and new entrants and to address kind of community concerns. Uh, that tool hasn't been used yet. It has been passed through, uh, but it is available there. Excuse me. And the council has been uh, looking at that. Um, so again, trying to stay within my rough timeline here. Uh, the other questions uh, that we were sent, uh, how robust is this information in your, in your region? Uh, does it depend on the fishery and, and, and so on? Uh, so I think overall we have fairly robust information since we do share data collection with the states and work with Pacific states um, and, and the federal government. We have a fair amount of information, whether it is exactly applicable to equity questions we i think i would just say ditto to what mike mike said in that um, we collect a lot of information on the corporate entities uh going down to the the person and the corporate structure we do have where they live but we don't have a lot of data on um uh, you know um kind of um things related to uh you know ethnicity and things like that um I can have those those forms uh, again if if those are if that, that's of interest to you we can send those along we do in the ground fish fishery have more of that kind of information as one of the things part of the catch shares program is that we required a lot of information on um the ownership in, um, interests and uh largely to answer the question of excessive shares that's required under the Magnuson Act. And so we have a lot of more information on that. Again, I don't know how much it goes down into social economic uh, identifiers. Um, not much though. Um, and um, the, uh, um, the one thing that I probably should have put up in a bullet here, but you know, there are, there are efforts by both of the science centers to do, um, um, they do, do surveys occasionally of kind of economic concerns, including there used to be a survey by someone at the Northwest Center, um, and she uh, would look even talking to crew members, you know, talking about crew members and, and their participation in fisheries. Um, it was all voluntary, um, but she was actually fairly successful in getting kind of the, that kind of those kind of considerations. Um, and uh, but nothing, there was no formal mandatory kind of uh, information gathering there. So um, anyway, I think that is it uh, for me uh, on the, the presentation. But again, happy to um, stay and answer questions. Frank, thank, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I thought the Gafo region was pretty big. <laughs> you you win the prize, I think, for... Uh, the, the the geographic range. So one of the things that I would just like your thoughts on, you said about how difficult it is to identify, you know, those who are not in the room, that must be made even more difficult when there are traditional and cultural differences across a region as big as this. So So is that something that you actively work on? or just as something that you're aware of? 
we are actively working on it. As Mike said, there has been um, a, a recent push to focus on these kind of issues. And so both at the council level and the regional level, and then, as I said, through this Marine uh, Resource Education Program, all three kind of entities are looking into this. And the challenges are um, um, even just how do you go about that? You know, again, you're, you're, you can't just send out a form because you don't have any addresses for or for people. And so uh, the way it has been working, um, just to give you a, a flavor of what's going on, is that we're working um, with our state folks. They are the people most often in the ports. Um, our observer program often is or is also out in the ports a lot. And so we're trying to work through those entities to just find out who are the people that you know are out there fishing uh, and participating, but that aren't participating in the council process. We, we have made some um, uh, identification of folks that could potentially go down a road of kind of in, in incorporating those people into the process. Uh, but just let's say for the marine education uh, program, we uh, what do you do? Uh, do you, uh, you know, it would be nice to have something that all can uh, attend, but Oftentimes, language is a huge barrier. Um, a lot of the Vietnamese fishermen that we know of, um, and to a certain, but also uh, more, probably more so Chinese and and Hispanic, they don't speak the language. So that that you know, going to a, a uh, education a council workshop, you know, would not help them, and unless we had uh, interpreters, you know, for for them or uh, what they do in the marine education program in the southeast is that they do have a Spanish language only program for outreach that they do um, anyway. So yes, it's something that we're working on, but uh, I wouldn't say that a whole lot of progress has been made and it's continuing uh, con continuing to be worked on. Great, thank you. Um, I see four hands in front of me. Uh, so Jim, you're first. Sure, hi Frank, good to see you. Um, I actually have two questions. I hope that's okay, but hopefully they're short. So one is um, maybe some reflections on why the 10% set aside hasn't really been utilized uh, yet. And two, in the uh, decision-making around the FMPs, you know, obviously the consideration of ports comes in, but do you have examples where the consideration of a port or the impacts on different ports led to a different decision rather than just classifying what might happen? Um, well, uh, first of all, about why adaptive management hasn't been used. Well, uh, one of the things is that it, it was anticipated that in the first few years of the catch share program that it probably wouldn't be used because you wanted to let the catch share program come into place. So catch share program started in 2011. So I guess in my mind, um, as the person sitting on the council for that, I was thinking, well, you know, at least three years and maybe five years, uh, you know, there, there won't re really be much need there. But uh, where it is right now is that the council has discussed this. They did a five-year review and there's been a couple of other agenda items. You can imagine that the people that are getting that pass-through, you know, want to keep getting that pass-through. And there, that is the discussion that the, the problems that could potentially be addressed by the adaptive management program haven't been so large that the council has felt that they needed to act. And the other side is actively pushing to not act. So those two things, I think, have led to a little to no action on that. Um, as far as kind of, you know, action on ports, I think maybe it's actually related to the, the, the best example I can go is kind of a negative example. When the council did a buyback um, in the early 2000s, um, to get rid of um, excess capacity, that ended up impacting uh, two or three ports in kind of Southern Oregon and Northern California where almost Crescent City had almost all of their vessels eliminated in the buyback. And so that port went from an active port to a pretty much desolate port. Uh, the council was affected by that. And that did affect their discussions for the cat share program. They were worried about creating those kind of 
uh, problems. And that's why one of the reasons that they put in things like for the cash share program, the first couple of years of the cash share programs, you could not get rid of all of your quota. You had to wait a little, or it might've been one year. I can't remember. Sorry, it's getting to be a little old. But anyway, there was a time where you had to hold on to your quota to allow you to get familiar with the program. And so those are kind of the I mean, only two examples that kind of pop into my head, you know, that there were kind of equity considerations uh, that the council wanted to address. So, thank you. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Stephen. Hi, Frank. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I also have two, two kind of quick questions, uh, if that's okay. So the first one was you mentioned that the NEPA process is one of the ways that, that social or equity information comes up. And I was wondering if you could talk just a little bit about you know, the type of, of information or depth of information that you typically see in the NEPA reports. And then the, the second one is related to that of where the, you mentioned the council sometimes directly requests equity uh, information or analyses. Uh, are those targeted towards the science centers or where do those requests go to um, was the second one. So thank you. Okay, so as far as the kind of the NEPA and the RIR IRFA, again, it is more focused on kind of the economic side. You know, how much money is flowing into ports? Or what size classes of vessels are participating in the fishery? Uh, and you know, what is kind of the turnover in in uh, fishing effort? And how does it shift? You know, over the years and things along those lines. Again, it is not really focused terribly much on demographic information. It's more on a kind of a port side, port uh, vessel size and vessel type kind of information. Um, there, may, there is some mention occasionally, you know, of typical demo, uh, some demographic groups, but I would say it's very small. It is not, um, uh, uh, there's not a lot of information there. And um, holy cow, oh, the council requests. So Again, even, even the council requests are kind of focused on this. Every once in a while, something will come up in an initial an analysis that indicates, well, maybe this port may be more affected than another port. So they'll ask for more information on uh, specifics related to that. And it really depends on the, the question. Sometimes that question would go to uh, a management team. With the, our, our council has management teams that are comprised of federal and state uh, biologists, not necessarily scientists. Uh, they often do a lot of the analysis. Um, then obviously the science centers can be called upon and then even the SSC can be called upon uh, to answer these types of, of questions. Uh, but they're usually fairly specific. Most often, again, related to things like impacts on ports, impacts on vessel classes and things along those lines. Thank you, Frank. Rachel. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Frank, for this presentation. It's been super helpful. I was curious, could you talk a little bit about, um, do you have specific data needs or requirements related to the tribal fisheries and that federal trust responsibility? And if you do, is it the feds collecting and providing that data? Or are you getting it from other sources? Could you talk about that dimension of, of your sure. region? Again, we work, you know, with the tribal uh, tribal uh, managers. The most tribal fisheries, I would say, the vast majority, um, I'll say, all of them. All of them have some management capability, and uh, um, and then there's also a couple of commissions. There's the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission and the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission that have scientists there. So the tribes themselves collect the data and provide it to us. Um, and uh, so we work with them to, to get that data. And, and, and it's something that, um, you know, is an annual annual process. Um, it's fairly well resolved now about how that goes about um, getting done. And so, but uh, there are some issues that we have to work with individual tribes, uh, but most issues uh, are the tribes themselves will, you know, already put information into the system. And this is actually something I probably put a, should have put on the slide. We have something called PACFIN and RECFIN, which is the databases that support commercial fishing and recreational fishing. So the tribes are part of that process, and um, and they put information into those 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 two databases. And is it primarily fishery data, or does the data collection include like demographic data on impacts to tribal participation or how many people are participating or is it 
fishery status? Um, it is primarily uh, fisheries data, but um, there will be, again, uh, it is in my recollection during, you know, a harvest specifications process or a fishery amendment process or a major change like going to catch shares, there will be some of that information revealed by the tribes, mostly by a kind of not public comment, but comment by the tribes to the council. This is how this is going to affect us. Um, and, and, and it's done that way. I don't believe there's any standard report on tribal participation that goes into the system. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, Helen, you're next. Great, thanks. Uh, so Frank, at the beginning of your presentation, you talked a little bit about how there are certain groups of fishers and communities that are active, not just in the region that you're talking about today, but also up in Alaska. Um, you touched later on survey work, and then you were talking about issues that are important at a community level, like climate change um, and community well-being. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about maybe data limitations or challenges, or if you don't think there are any, <laughs> you could say that as well. Um, but related to the fact that if we're thinking about equity and access, we at a very high level could be thinking across region here, but we've already broken things down. We're hearing from you, we're hearing from somebody from Alaska separately. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how does that data or how could that data come together or maybe not? Well, again, just to kind of uh, go back to what Mike said at the beginning, I think the biggest challenge is is finding out about the underserved communities and, you know, and trying to reach out and see if there may be issues that are just not being captured. Because just like him, you know, we have the uh, uh, the people that show up to every single council meeting, uh, and then we have other people that show up to most council meetings. Uh, and then we have every once in a while, you know, people coming that don't come very often. Um, that is actually, I keep on pointing out MREP, the MREP program has actually led to more participation. So we have we have done some re outreach and, and that's worked and people are participating. Um, looking at the broader thing, you know, we do work well with the Alaska region, and particularly on, um, you know, on halibut and ground fish and endangered species. We have to. Our salmon um, some of our salmon swim all the way up to the Bering Sea, so we do actually have active ESA consultation uh, work that we do with, with the region on that. Uh, and so we have a pretty good handle on the people that do go fish up there. Um, and, um, and it's not, it's not a hidden thing, you know, our, we actually like the whiting fishery, we will regularly hear from them. Well, our, we believe we're not going to catch as much whiting this year because the Pollock A and B season is blank, you know, and so we're going to put our money there and money and time there. Uh, so we have that kind of information um, uh, directly from the industry, uh, usually. Um, related to, maybe to get to your question, related to kind of equity and access, you know, I don't, again, we don't know. There may be people that would love to, you know, fish in our fishery and go up there. But just like Mike, a lot of that is a limited access program. And with the exception potentially of the adaptive management program, most of it, you you would have to spend a significant amount of money to enter a fishery, uh, particularly up in Alaska. I think the the, the buying quota up there is uh, more expensive than us and we're pretty expensive. So uh, so uh, I don't know if I'm quite answering your question. So if, if, if you, if, if I, if I've got it, great. If not, if you could ask a more refined, uh, or <laughs> no. not, I shouldn't say not more refined, but just ping me where I got it wrong. I think you touched on it. I guess I was just thinking as we sort of silo and today we hear each of the individual presentations, if there was anything that you thought we should be thinking about that relates to these cross-regional sorts of considerations, um, and maybe there's not. Well, uh, I, I guess that's a that's a hard question for for me to answer. Every once in a while, we do hear. You know, I although I I've never directly worked in HMS management. I have been at meetings where they talk about ground fish and HMS, and and some of the HMS folks uh, they do talk about. Well, I wish I had access to this. Uh, I wish I had access to that, and you know, I or even some of them. And I can even bring this back from my Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission days. Fishing fishing vessels used to fish for a lot of things. 
But as management came online with the Magnuson Act, they they were siloed into particular things. And then instead of being, you know, just a person that fishes for whatever is available and whatever I can get the highest price for, they were forced into certain fisheries. And some of them would like there to be more discussion of allowing them access to other fisheries. But those kind of comments have become fewer and fewer as the years have gone by. But that's a hard question for me to answer. It's almost, to me, that's, you would need to ask the industry and the, and the you know, the, the interested public that, that kind of question. But sorry, that's all I can do. <laughs> all right, Frank, thank you once again for um, your presentation and your thoughtful response to our questions. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break so I can fill my cup of tea back up um, and we will start up again at 2.30 uh, with Gretchen Harrington, who I see is already on, on the call, who's the Assistant Regional Administrator for the Alaska Regional Fisheries Office. And before I go, I have to leave now. I will try to make it back for the general uh, purpose discussion. Uh, I think I can right now. Uh, but I just want to let you know I'm going to drop off for, for at least a couple of hours. So, right. yeah, bye. Frank, thanks. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Bye. And uh, the uh, clock says it's 2.21, so it'll be a fairly short break to 2.30. Thank you all. who is the Assistant Regional Administrator for the Alaska Fisheries Office. Uh, and Gretchen, you're back. It was just about to introduce you and you slid off screen. Um, so um, welcome to the meeting. I know you have been on for a little while. You've uh, got a sense of the flavor of the um, questions we're interested in. Um, we greatly appreciate you making time to talk to us today, um, and I'm going to turn the webinar over to you. All right. Thanks, Tom. Hello, everyone. I'm Gretchen Harrington with the Alaska Region, and I did sneak away. I was trying to turn on my light. We have a rare sunny day in Juneau, Alaska, so it made me a little dark, at least in my square. Um, so I apologize if, if it's too dark, uh, but I will be showing a presentation. So um, I'll go ahead and start that. Okay. All right, I think it's, do you guys see my presentation? We see it as a, as a sort of tabbed version of it. It's not in okay. presentation mode. Now it is. Okay. Right. All right. Thanks, Wonderful. Gretchen. Yeah. So we, we don't use Zoom. And so um, it's, yeah, a little bit awkward getting it uh, started. Anyway, so hi, everyone. So um, what I'm going to talk about today are the in response to your questions, specifically information on the Alaska region. Um, a lot of what Frank and Mike had talked about um, is very similar in the Alaska region as well. Managing under the Magnus and Stevens Act, using the council process with our Alaska Fishery Science Center, collecting a lot of the data that we use. We also have at ACFIN um, and a state of Alaska that has a lot of history managing fisheries. So they, collect a lot of data. So our process um, issues and challenges are very similar to, to what they explain, but there's some uh, unique Alaska things as well. Um, so for an overview, we have uh, commercial fisheries, uh, recreational uh, subsistence, and an emerging sec sector for uh, aquaculture, mostly focused now on shellfish and um, help in the in the near shore. We 
work with uh, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, the US Coast Guard, US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, as well as our, our Science Center and other NOAA offices. Um, we have Alaska Native tribes and tribal consortiums, um, communities and local governments, non-governmental organizations, um, and other general public. So this is kind of a confusing chart, but I think it's very interesting and kind of gives you an overview of the complexity of our fisheries. So um, we have a wide variety of fishing vessels participating in the federal fisheries off Alaska, um, and they can be grouped into these different categories based on um, the fish species they target and the gear used, uh, their, how they're licensed, um, and then each license have a, has a specific endorsement. Um, and then el eligibility to uh, participate in catch share programs. And I will get into more detail on our catch share programs and then by regulations. So we, we take a, a very complex matrix of fisheries and we chop them up into very small pieces. We issue over uh, 1200 tax. So uh, total allowable catches and I'll, I will get into more detail on this, but I thought that this was a good overview of, you can see our different programs. Um, and then the vessels, some participate in more than one program, some participate only in, in an individual program. And these are help define when and where they catch, when they fish, where they fish, what they catch and what gear they use and what type of vessel they are. Um, so who manages the fisheries off Alaska? The National Marine Fisheries Service. We work very closely with the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Um, we have Alaska Board of Fisheries and Alaska Department of Fish and Game and the International Pacific Halibut Commission. So our regional administrator, John Curlin, wasn't able to make it today because he is at a IPHC commissioner's meeting. We primarily manage groundfish in the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska. So Pollock, Pacific Cod, um, number of species. Uh, we also manage crab in the Bering Sea in conjunction with the state of Alaska. So we have a fishery management plan under the Magnuson Act that delegates specific management measures to the state of Alaska, but we control the entry. We've done a rationalization program or which is what we call a catch share program. We also have a small scallop fishery that we also manage uh, with the state of Alaska under a federal FMP. We have a, a halibut fishery, um, which is managed in conjunction with IPHC that sets the harvest limits. And then the North Pacific Fishery Management Council makes the allocation decisions. Um, and there's smaller fisheries for herring, a large salmon fishery that's managed by the state. And then there's a few other much smaller fisheries. Um, so in the, the thinking about equity in fisheries management is, is interesting. I think in, in my career that that concept has changed a lot from when we first started doing our rationalization programs like the halibut and salmon fish IFQ program. Um, but I think the council and NIMS in our decision making, uh, the, our primary job is uh, ensuring sustainability, right? So it, we achieve equity in that sense of that if there's fish to harvest, then they're available for people to harvest them. Um, and that we uh, consider all affected parties in the development of fishery management programs and regulations. I think both the council and the agency do a good job of really figuring out who's going to be an impact and how. And we have provisions for entry level access for most of our programs. And we, the council has built that in to some extent. Um, uh, we have measures that ensure the benefits and burdens of fishing are distributed fair and justly among stakeholders. This is largely driven by the provisions of the Magnus and Stevens Act. Um, and we do that through sector splits, which means taking a harvest amount of a certain species and dividing it among different sectors. So here in vessel type, um, we have cat share programs. We have the community development quota program, which I'll talk about. Um, and we have an IFQ program for halibut and sable fish, and then what we call crab rationalization, which is our cat share program for the crab fisheries. We also have 
a number of other cat share programs. Um, we also, and this is I think really important, especially uh, in lately is we really try to manage the groundfish fishery to minimize its impacts on other marine resources. So uh, minimizing bycatch of, of species that are important to other fisheries like halibut, salmon, and crab, minimizing impacts to habitat by closing areas, um, making gear modifications, um, things like that. So those are, those are a lot of the things we think about when we're designing programs for the groundfish fisheries. Uh, the sector splits, so um, that allows the different gear types and it helps level the playing field for different gear types um, and minimize conflicts over, over resources, um, facilitates management and um, it's based on historic participation, economic needs, cultural significance, conservation needs, um, and we regularly review and adjust to ensure continued fairness and equity. So our cat share programs, um, we have besides the ones I've mentioned, um, we have the American Fisheries Act, um, Amendment 80, uh, which is the non-pollock groundfish in the Bering Sea, um, the rockfish program. And when the council sets the initial allocations, um, it's based on uh, historic and recent participation. That's under the Magnuson Act. Um, but the council has also explored a lot of other tools. Our, our catch share programs are extremely, extremely complex because of that. Um, we usually provide provisions for uh, to promote equity for new entrants. Um, CRU, the Crab Rationalization Program, uh, established a separate uh, type of quota share for and allocated that for CRU. Um, and we had CRU data from the State of Alaska um, Commercial Fisheries Injury Commission. We also have done a lot of um, community protection measures. So there's a there's an element of learning from each cat share program. Our first one was halibut sablefish uh, IFQ program. The council learned a lot from that program when it did the um, crab rationalization program. And so a lot of the uh, features of that program that make it complex were, were there intended to, to allow the crab to be uh, delivered and processed in historic communities. So accounting for that historic community participation in the fisheries as well. Um, oops. Sorry. Uh, and monitoring enforcement. We have heavily monitored fisheries. We uh, have complex copra catch accounting and a very robust observer program. Um, and we review, regularly review our catch share programs and the council has them on, on different review schedules and those reports are all available on the council's webpage. So I think one of the, to me, one of the most interesting programs is the community development quota program. That is, um, represents 65 coastal communities. It was enacted by statute. Uh, we didn't have the authority under the Magnuson Act. So, so statute, um, so this was created in a separate, in separate statute. Uh, we have 65 communities. Those were then grouped into six nonprofit uh, CDQ corporations. Um, and they receive uh, allocations of multiple groundfish, specific halibut and crab species uh, off the top. So once the council sets the total allowable catch, a portion, depending on the, the fishery, is then allocated to the CDQ group. There's also constraints on how the CDQ group spends their, their incomes, and so they've invested heavily in the Bering Sea fisheries. Um, most Bering Sea fisheries have a very large CDQ ownership. So it's in addition to the allocation. So they've taken the allocations with the income they've earned from managing those allocations, they've invested more heavily in, in our fisheries. Um, 
and they put a lot of that money back into their local communities in for fish processing. So, uh, and other things like that. And the state of Alaska just completed its 10 year review of the CDQ program. Um, and that written report is also available on the council web page. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the Halibut Sablefish IFQ program. That was our very first one that was really focused Again, and I said equities changed over the years. So that one was focused on equity among fishermen, so among participants. And so there were a very a number of um, things added to that program. Um, share classes, ownership caps, uh, the, the quota was divided by areas to make sure that the fishing was spread out. So if you have quota for an area, you can only fish in that area. Um, and it increased the value of the fishery. It also took a derby fishery that was uh, dangerous and, and wasteful and it was allowed it to spread out over time and become a lot more safe. Um, also reduced excess capacity. I also mentioned the uh, crab fishery. So it manages multiple stocks in the Bering Sea. Um, it had, it was called, what we, we, well, what we called at the time a three pie program. So it provided, um, uh, it was designed um, to help fishermen and communities and processors. Um, and it also provided crew member share based on recency and community protections. You know, one of the things though that we've noticed over time is when the council designs these programs and puts these measures in place, these constraints. So like crew, it was really important at the time that the crew shares had a recency so that only crew active people that go on boats and fish can qualify for these quota share. But then once people get these shares, they're like, oh, hey, wait, those are constraining. I want to have more flexibility. So it's a, it's a constant um, trade-off, right? Between providing flexibility and, um, and then making the, the constraints that keep it, um, keep it available for different user groups. So we have a lot of data. We like data in the Alaska region. Um, we have uh, a, a really robust observer program. Many of our large vessels are catcher processors and are 100% observed, meaning at least they have uh, sometimes two observers on the vessel, making sure every haul is observed. Um, we have a partial coverage category for smaller boats, which still averages uh, maybe around or between 20 and 30% observer coverage, depending on the fishery and everything. We have electronic monitoring that we use not only for compliance, but for catch counting. Um, all of our rationalization programs have some uh, economic and socioeconomic data collection program built in. Um, you know, and we've learned a lot over the years. Every time you do something new and, and different, you learn benefits and, and drawbacks. Um, we also do a survey, uh, our Alaska Fishery Science Center surveys for stock assessments. Um, and we are figuring out, and I think I have a slide a little bit later on local traditional knowledge and how, how we can start to use that in our, in our process. So our primary uh, data source is the catch counting system for the amount of fish harvested and, and who's harvesting it and where they're harvested and what are the, what's the bycatch. Um, yeah, I don't think I need to go into that detail, but I think this is an interesting graphic of showing all the data that goes into our catch accounting system and then where that data goes and how it's used. So it's used for in-season management um, protected fisheries for participants so we know exactly how many salmon are harvested in the Bering Sea Pollock fishery, for example, um, with, uh, we also have, uh, economic and socioeconomic data. We have, um, an annual economic status of the groundfish fisheries, the safe report that 
that looks at that. Um, we have ex vessel data from the state of Alaska. The, um, also in the state of Alaska, they have the CFEC permit, so fisheries that, that they manage, they collect the data on um, participants. We have community profiles and a SEPO report, which is, wait, I wrote it out. It's, um, I think, a really great report, annual community engagement and participation overview. So that's produced by our Alaska Fishery Science Center that looks at each community uh, and then how the, what's their participation in the groundfish fisheries, a uh, little more demographics about the communities. We also have census data um, and other, other work trying to understand the composition and dependence on fisheries in the communities in Alaska. So this is something the council is looking at, and it's a, a priority to figure out how to improve how we include local and traditional knowledge. Um, I would say it's something we're learning a lot about and trying to, the council uh, formed a task force with uh, diverse members and they put together a, a plan um, that's currently uh, out for public review, um, but I think it's still gonna take a, a while before we figure out exactly like, what data is out there that's useful for decision-making that we can incorporate into our decision-making process um, and how do, we, how do we collect that information and present it that's in a meaningful way. Um, we also, we manage subsistence halibut we do not manage subsistence salmon, um, but we're we're collecting data on the halibut use for subsistence users. Oh, and this was just the questions you asked. So um, I think I will leave it at that and see if there's any questions. Gretchen, thank you very, very much for a, a really uh, interesting overview of fisheries I know very little about. One of the things that struck me was that one of the ways the region has seemingly worked to include equity is frequent change. Right? When there is appearance of inequity, there are data that are brought to bear to change. You said you collect lots of data, but are those are those decisions data driven or are those decisions more perception? driven? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, honestly, I think it's a bit of both. Um, we, you know, the council public process allows participants to tell their story. And so a lot of times that's a, a lot of what the, the council considers. And then council staff and the agency, we work to to understand that as well. Like what data do we have that would either support or um, or how do we consider what we're hearing from the public? Um, and I think, and you're right, it is in some ways a little reactive as far as if we see something happening because we've implemented one program, we implement the next program to try to mitigate that. But, but most of it, I would say, we do do a lot of qualitative analysis. I think that's that's just par for the course. Um, but we are able to um, have enough data to do quantitative analysis when available. And we do have data on who participate. Like when I talk with colleagues from like the um, Caribbean region, like they don't know who participates or where even they land, but we know that we know who fishes, what they catch, where they catch. We have really specific data on the fisheries. Um, and I think that that's, that really helps in our decision making. Yep, thank you. Uh, Rashid. Yeah. yeah, so thank you very much. I mean, I, I came into this uh, believing that Alaska is likely to be uh, ahead or one of the ahead uh, management councils because of, especially because of a community development quota that I've given that as an example around the world. So, and, and you didn't disappoint, that's good. I, I see a lot of interesting stuff in there, in your presentation. 
And, and so I'm, I'm wondering, one of the things we had earlier is this legacy. People have this legacy issues, and so it's very difficult to be as flexible as you guys have been, as uh, Tom just uh, alluded to. So do you have legacy issues, and how do, how, how do you negotiate around them to be able to be this kind of adaptive and flexible? Um, well, I'll start my response, but then I might ask a little bit more on the, the meaning of legacy. So I think in Alaska, one of the things we benefit from is we have healthy resources. So that allows more, um, well, we have healthy resources, but we are in a time of climate change. So things are changing. But I think for most of the development of these programs, we had healthy resources. Um, we also have uh, one state, right? So things are simpler for us in, in negotiating and how we do this. Um, for, can I ask what you mean by legacy? Yeah, yeah. It, it's this idea that permits or uh, quotas uh, have been allocated to, to mm -hmm. groups or entities and, and it is their thing. So you cannot easily bring in new entrants and so on, right? Uh, that's what... Yes. That's my yeah. understanding. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, All yeah. right. That, that's what I would have assumed, but I wanted to make sure I had that right. So yes, we do have that issue now that we have these programs. Um, uh, even though we're always very clear that, you know, a quota share is a, is a privilege, not a right. It's still people yeah. feel like they make investments, they get loans, they, um, they, they do all of this, um, and so they really do feel it is a right. I think the council has built in new entrance um, mm. pieces in their programs, specifically for new entrants. I know in the Gulf of Alaska. So most of our rationalized fisheries are in the Bering Sea. Uh, there is interest mm. in more rationalization of the fisheries in the Gulf of Alaska. Those are smaller fisheries and there's more people. So it makes it a little bit more uh, difficult, but I, you know, people do talk about having a CDQ type program in the Gulf of Alaska or doing other things like mm. that. Um, but yeah, I think changing an existing program, it would be very hard. We have a few oh, yeah. special tribal entities who are interested in changing the halibut sablefish program because in that program, like I said, the main issue was fishermen and dividing it among dividing the catch among fishermen, but they mm -hmm. didn't allocate to communities or provide the, the ability for small participants in local communities. And some of the people who were initial issuees for economic reasons sold their quota and now they can't buy it back because it's too expensive or they don't have the capital. So, so yeah, there's a lot of issues. Yes, there's a lot of legacy issues. I agree. Yeah, yeah thank you. But somehow you managed to negotiate that. So there's some learning, right? That can be done from your system. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Rachel, one last question. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Gretchen. That was really interesting. You mentioned, you know, some of the challenges working in Alaska around census data, given, in, given the size of some of our smaller communities and villages. And I was curious, um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges related uh, to the collection of impacts to tribes or tribal participation in fisheries? Like, is there could there be sharing across federal agencies in terms of this, or have you guys given any thought to how we could get better data on understanding those types of impacts, given the the size of the community of the communities that have been affected? Yeah, that's a really good question and one we struggle with because Alaska is different than uh, the lower 48, as you, you probably know this, but we, um, so we have the CDQ program, but that didn't provide allocation to tribes, it provided allocations to Alaska Natives in the CDQ uh, groups. Um, we also have um, Alaska Native corporations that that are also not coordinated with the tribe. So how do we get information from tribal participants? We've we've tried. Um, one of the things that 
is really important to me and that we're working on is how to more clearly communicate um, instead of like, you know, here's a thousand pages, our usual analysis is so dense and there's so much information, but like, how do we provide information to the tribes in a way that's digestible so that they can provide their input in a meaningful way? Um, yeah. We do work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the state of Alaska. We provide subsistence information. We consult with tribes. Um, but I think because of these other things, it's more difficult for tribes in Alaska to participate. Mm -hmm. They don't have the same amount of infrastructure um, that say, for example, tribes in Washington state have because they're able to hire more staff, things like that, that there's not that economic. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think so, that's something we're working on. Okay, that's that's really helpful. Is it possible for information sharing across federal agencies? Like, could could you work with BIA to get like information on the Alaska Native role to understand how many participants are currently or so in the past? Now? When you say participants, so they are not going to be participants. Most there are uh, Alaska natives that are fishermen in the NIMS managed fisheries, right? We manage fisheries in the EDC. Um, but by and large, there's not a tribal, it's not like in Washington state, there's not a tribal participants in our fisheries. Now they're impacted um, and, and we value their input. We hired a tribal liaison to, to help with that. Um, but they're not, not directly re regulated fishery participants. So it is different than Washington state in, in that sense as well. Um, we send them things, uh, we request, or we provide information um, for consultations. There is a lot of data collected on tribes by, like I said, US Fish and Wildlife Department of Interior that actually do manage tribal fishermen, but we don't. Mm. But you could, like, regardless of treaty rights or status, you would be able to know, or you could potentially know, like, how many, how many tribal members historically participated in halibut IFQ versus, you know, over time. Like, would you be yes. able to have access to that information? Okay, so um, that's not confidentiality. I, I think we could. You know, I don't know if anybody's looked at that. Um, who... I think it would be fascinating to know how many Alaska natives were initial issues of halibut quota share. Because what we hear anecdotally is the the most of the Alaska native initial issues, a lot of them sold for various reasons over time. Um, yeah. But yeah, that would be fascinating. And I don't, I would have to see how they could go about figuring that out. But we don't have tribal treaty rights like in Washington state. It's so, yeah. Um, Lisa, I see your hand is up. Uh, last quick question. Yeah, I was really interested in um, the efforts to think about local and traditional knowledge and, and how it can work. Um, and you mentioned some of the, you know, bit broad picture challenges about that. I just wonder if there, is there a, policy guidance or a, a document, something that explains like the rationale for that program that we could get access to? Yes, yes. So our council does an amazing job. They post on their agendas and I can email it to the folks that reached out to me, but the on each council agenda, they post all the documents for that agenda item. And there is a document that's out for public review that talks about the council's um, task force and the work they did and what they envision in the, for the future. Mm -hmm. and I will Thank you. That. Yeah, I'll email that after this. Thank you, Gretchen. Th thank you for really, really interesting presentation um, on a system I knew very little about and, and the thoughtfulness that the Council um, has put into this and the office has put into this is really very impressive. So thank you very much. I suspect we may be darkening your door again at some point because this was a lot to take on board, but thanks very much indeed. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I also, I just want to add that I will not be able to be here from 4 to 4.30 either. I have a, uh, something else, and I apologize for that. No, no, no not a reason to apologize. Thank, thank you. Um, so we're going to take another huge geographic leap. We went from the northeast to the northwest. Uh, now we're going from Alaska to the southeast. So um, strap in, and because it will be a very different si system. Um, uh, I welcome uh, Andy Strelchek to the w webinar. Andy is the regional administrator for NOAA's southeast region. Andy, welcome. Thank you, Tom. I uh, just want to do a sound check. Hear me okay? Coming through very clear. Perfect. Well, I want to thank the uh, committee for the invitation to speak to you today and also accommodating my schedule, which has been a very busy day. Uh, like you just noted, Tom, I think you'll be experiencing a little bit of whiplash here. Um, very different fisheries in terms of how we operate in the southeast relative to Alaska, going from the nation's largest commercial fisheries now to the nation's largest recreational fisheries. I do not have a physical presentation for you today, so I'm just going to speak and walk through um, the questions that you had posed and do my best to answer those questions over the next 20 or so minutes, leave some time for uh, you to ask questions. Um, but as noted, uh, we have a very diverse region. Um, my uh, office manages uh, fisheries from Texas to North Carolina, including uh, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. We work with three separate fishery management councils. Uh, we have very diverse fisheries uh, that operate in the region from uh, commercial fisheries, large-scale commercial fisheries, to recreational uh, fleets of private anglers and four higher vessels. Um, most of our fisheries that we manage um, can be very contentious, deal with a lot of allocation decisions because they're uh, divided between the commercial and recreational sectors with regard to access. And so I'll talk some about that. Um, but in terms of the Southeast region, the fisheries themselves, um, those are also very diverse. Um, our primary species of management are reef fish or snapper grouper species. And so the South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico has um, upwards of 40 to 50 species of reef fish that each of those manages. Um, often those are caught uh, in conjunction with one another. Uh, and so uh, a wide variety of snappers, groupers, jacks, and other reef fishes that can be caught together. Um, we also manage uh, species of coastal pelagics like mackerels, um, as well as uh, highly migratory species that occur in the region. Uh, and then we have some uh, lobster and shrimp fisheries as well. Um, the Caribbean is um, very different, but uh, in some ways very similar in terms of uh, very diverse fisheries of snappers and groupers. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the primary uh, commercial fishery is the shrimp fishery, which operates by trawl. Um, there's also a shrimp trawl fishery in the South Atlantic Ocean. No, no industrial trawl fisheries in the Caribbean. Uh, most of our fisheries are prosecuted using hook and line. Uh, we do uh, authorize um, long line gear. And then there are some um, limited use of traps for black sea bass in the South Atlantic and spiny lobster in both the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, South Atlantic Ocean. So uh, I think the take home that I wanted to just start you with is that it's a very diverse um, fishery uh, with a lot of uh, diverse participants um, that are uh, prosecuting and harvesting those species. Um, the responsibilities are shared not only obviously with my office, but also with, um, I think well, we have eight, eight coastal states uh, and two territorial governments, as well as the Southeast Fisheries Science Center that uh, performs our science and research for federal fisheries management. Um, you had asked about considerations of equity into the decision-making process. Um, I'll, I'll focus on kind of our overarching federal mandates, but then try to get into a little bit of the specifics with regard to uh, equity issues in the region. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, um, our primary uh, issues with surrounding equity pertain to allocations between sectors, primarily the recreational and commercial sectors. 
um, but also we do allocate uh, in the Gulf of Mexico uh, quotas among states uh, for red snapper. And then uh, back in 2007 and 2010, we implemented IFQ programs for uh, grouper and snapper in the Gulf of Mexico uh, and made uh, initial decisions about allocations uh, for those programs. Um, we also have a small program for um, wreckfish individual transferable quota program in the South Atlantic that's one of the oldest in the country. All of those IFQ programs are based on kind of historical participation and I'll talk a little bit about kind of the challenges we're facing now and how equity is kind of playing into considerations before the councils at this point. Um, in terms of you know how equity factors into the decision making process, as you well know, um, the regional councils are intended to represent diverse sectors and viewpoints. Uh, and so that's the starting point to ensure fair and uh, balanced apportionment among the, amongst the uh, sectors and, and representation on the councils. I will say that I think this is an area where certain constituent groups feel like we could do better. Um, there's a viewpoint that the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council is unbalanced and therefore resulting in um, inequitable decisions um, related to fisheries management. Um, but overall, um, a lot of the work that we do obviously is driven by the Magnuson Act and considerations of optimum yield in terms of what will provide for the greatest net overall benefits to the nation. Um, we obviously consider National Standard 4 in our allocation decisions to ensure we don't discriminate between residents of different states and that if it becomes necessary to allocate or assign privileges, that those uh, allocations are fair and equitable among fishermen and reasonably calculated to promote conservation. Um, I will say that's also an area of contention uh, based on allocation decisions um, in our region between sectors and the viewpoint uh, that's led to at least uh, the agency being sued over some of those allocation decisions uh, and that it's not been equitable to shift some or commercial allocation to the recreational sector. Uh, and so that's uh, certainly ongoing debate and uh, issue um, dealing, being dealt with in the court system at this stage for one of our primary reef fish species in the Gulf of Mexico. We also, uh, to the extent we can with rebuilding plans, um, consider conservation and management measures that um, allocate harvest restrictions and recovery benefits both fairly and equitably amongst the sectors. And in fact, recently the South Atlantic Council as an example, passed an allocation action that kind of re uh, results in reducing the impacts uh, or equitably distributing the impacts across sectors when the uh, quotas are being cut, but then as the stock recovers, also equitably increasing those benefits back to both sectors. Um, so those are uh, some of the considerations we deal with with rebuilding plans. And then um, a lot of the work obviously we do uh, includes uh, work with Executive Order 12866 uh, with regard to maximizing net benefits to the nation, the Regulatory Flexibility Act to determine if a proposed action is expected to place small entities at a significant competitive disadvantage, as well as social effects analyses that are contained in all of our uh, amendments and, and fishery management actions um, related to fishing communities and those engaged in the fishing industry. Um, in addition to all that, we have a number of executive orders pertaining to environmental justice, equity, and underserved communities. And um, we have tools related to um, social indicators for coastal communities that include um, social vulnerability rankings um, that uh, are um, at a level related to the kind of place-based communities so we can look at the uh, effects impacts of our regulatory decisions related to that social indicators tool, but it is at a scale uh, related to the community and not at a finer scale for equity considerations. Um, one of the challenges that I wanted to note with all of this is that there's limited guidance, obviously, in terms of how both the agency analyzes and kind of explicitly accounts for equity considerations, but also how the council and NIMPS kind of balance equity consideration in light of a lot of other mandates and requirements um, imposed upon 
uh, them with regard to decision making. And then um, as kind of a couple of examples of kind of recent ongoing work that I think is useful. So in the um, IFQ programs in the Gulf of Mexico recently, there's been a lot of um, concerns that uh, with new entrants, they are having challenges obviously gaining access to the fishery or the price of obviously leasing allocation or buying quota share is really out of reach for many. And so um, the council working with the agency formed an IFQ focus group. And this is unlike kind of our typical advisory panels. And we created this focus group with intentional representation of diverse groups of people that participate in the fishery. So not just shareholders and those that um, are directly operating uh, in the program, but those that are um, um, ultimately like a public participant or a crew member or those that might not have shares or allocation, because we really felt it was important that we get those diverse group uh, viewpoints with regard to how the program was operating. We're also embarking in the region on um, equity and environmental justice focus groups. So we have a national strategy that's soon to roll out, but we're also doing a regional implementation of that strategy in the Southeast region. And over the course of the next four to six months, we intend to hold 20 plus focus group meetings um, throughout the entire region, South Atlantic Gulf and Caribbean, uh, to discuss with entities uh, in our fisheries uh, how we can uh, deliver our services in a more equitable manner. What are the barriers and challenges with um, equitable access to our fisheries and, and what changes and recommendations would they make for the agency? So that's work ongoing and I look forward to obviously uh, seeing the results of that and ultimately um, how that uh, translates into uh, changes in terms of the management process going forward. Uh, you asked about what information could equity considerations rely on in our region. Um, I mentioned earlier the NIMPS social indicators for coastal communities tool. Um, so that's already something that we have in uh, place now uh, and is uh, at the community place-based level in order to meet the requirements of national standard aid of the Magnuson Act. Um, there's also uh, what will be available soon, a community environmental justice explorer tool, tool that's being developed. And this builds off of our social indicators tool to describe uh, coastal community conditions. And that can be used to partially address some of the environmental justice mandates and uh, the recent executive orders at the community level. Um, we eventually hope to be able to use self-reported race, uh, ethnicity, sex, and age information through our federal fishing permits in the Gulf and South Atlantic to examine equity in our um, fisheries. Um, we have collected some of that information. Um, it's kind of gone through some fits and starts um, and uh, was not required at one point in time. Um, so it definitely has some gaps and limitations to the data. Um, and then we're also embarking soon on a cruise survey <coughs> that we conducted in the Southeast, uh, which will provide information on demographics of crew members. Um, the other thing I'll note with our IFQ programs, we do collect ownership percentage data on permit holders. Um, uh, that obviously is a requirement to ensure that share caps and, and uh, other uh, caps aren't exceeded within the program. And so um, that information is available uh, for uh, evaluating obviously uh, size of businesses, both large and small, as well as participation within our commercial IFQ programs. Um, you asked about how robust the information is in the region. Does it depend on the fishery? And can we provide some examples? Um, I would definitely say that the information is limited. I talked uh, about obviously the demographic challenges of the data that we're collecting from our permit system and some of the gaps uh, in that data. Um, we uh, obviously um, will uh, be able to use that data, but it's not necessarily fully complete. Um, we also, um, have uh, the social indicators data, but it's at the community level, right? And so ideally it would be uh, better suited uh, if we could use it at both the fishery or even the underserved population level. 
Um, and then um, the ownership data for permit applications can be sometimes incomplete or inaccurate for non-commercial IFQ permit holders. Um, so there's certainly gaps in that data that could be uh, improved to help obviously with small business questions uh, and other information that we collect uh, through our permitting process. Um, you asked about the sources of information. Um, I've already referred to the uh, NIMP social indicators tool uh, several times, so I won't repeat that. Um, we do have the uh, robust federal, federal survey, excuse me, federal um, vessel permit database um, with obviously some of the gaps and caveats that I mentioned earlier. Um, those uh, limitations are that, you know, we require that information to be entered uh, on our online system as of August 2021, but prior to that time, it was not a requirement of the applicant to submit that data. And so um, there's limitations, we're obviously using that data going back in time. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, talked about the uh, focus groups with underserved communities. Um, these are really gonna help us inform our decision-making uh, process related to fisheries management and uh, in particular identification of underserved populations. One of the key first steps really for us is identifying some of the groups that we need to be working with or that um, you know, view uh, us as a, a partner and, and where our services could be better utilized or weren't even aware of obviously the service we provide. And so that will be obviously a critical uh, informative step in that process. Um, you asked if there was additional information you think would be informative in decisions. Um, as I've mentioned, I think any of this basic just demographic information of participants in federal fisheries um, is really key and, and uh, as well as for information on subsistence use of federal fisheries. Uh, and those will be, you know, vital steps in attempting to address equity in our fisheries. And then um, research to gather information on underserved communities in our region and how that historically or, or currently being excluded from participating in our fisheries would be helpful in considering equity in our, equity in our region. Um, so a lot of just basic kind of data gathering that's needed that would help inform our processes. Um, and then the last question I believe you asked was limitations in terms of collecting this data. Uh, certainly funding is always kind of the, the main limitation uh, as well as staff time and staff expertise. Um, in my office, we have one full-time social scientist. There are certainly others in the uh, Southeast Fishery Science Center as well as one contractor at my office. And so social, social science data collection um, is key, but we certainly don't have a large amount of staff to actually be able to conduct and support this work. Um, and then, uh, you know, demographic data, I guess it's been a challenge in terms of even just um, getting approval to collect that information. Uh, and that's certainly kind of one of the limitations with regard to potentially concerns going forward that we might actually lose uh, accessibility to collect some of this data through our permit system. Um, so uh, overall, um, those are the kind of main challenges, main issues and uh, limitations as well as some of the success stories. So I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Andy, thanks very much for that, that really detailed overview. And once again, I think it is impressive to hear the range of issues and the range of fisheries that each of the region has to deal with and, and how different they are uh, from one to uh, 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 another. Uh, Grant. Yeah, thanks, uh, Andy, for that presentation. I agree, it was very, very useful uh, overview. I, I had some questions about the focus group um, thing that you're, you're planning to do, and I gathered it was 20 plus focus groups with underserved communities. Um, can you say a little bit more about what prompted that and also uh, what the data are going to look like in terms, I, I know this, we're anticipating things that haven't happened yet, but will those data be available? Will they be in summary form? What they're gonna look like? 
Um, yeah, I'm not going to be the best to kind of uh, speak to how the data might be available or be presented. What I can tell you is the impetus for it was our national uh, equity and environmental justice strategy that the National Marine Fishery Service is conducting right now. Um, we should be hopefully releasing that within the month. Um, but each region um, will also be producing a regional equity and environmental justice plan. And so uh, given um, some of the limitations and knowledge and information we have with regard to working with underserved communities, we felt it was really important as a first initial step to go out and conduct these focus groups um, to uh, seek input and information from um, various areas from throughout the region. And we do have um, set questions that are going to be uh, asked of each of the groups. That information will be synthesized and summarized and ultimately uh, inform our regional uh, EEJ strategy for the region. Uh, in terms of how that data gets kind of packaged and summarized separate from that regional EEJ, pl EEJ plan, I'd have to get back to you on that. Rachel. Thanks. Yeah, no, this has been really helpful and interesting. So building off of um, the last question, in some of the other um, regions that we heard from today, they talked about that initial step of even needing to identify or having a better sense of who the underserved were. And have you guys given any thought to that? Like, how would you do outreach? Or have you kind of identified already, like, these are the types of participants that we need to target through these workshops. And have you given any thought to how you will um, do that? And then I have a, a, another question, which I think is very short that I'm hoping to sneak in. Yes, so we have given a lot of thought to that. Um, and I'll just give like a couple of examples. So unlike some of the other regions um, that have a lot more engagement with the um, uh, tribes, we have not really been engaged with a lot of our federal fishery management actions or just federal management in general with the tribes in our region, right? So targeting working with um, tribes in our regions through a liaison um, is kind of one step, obviously, in the EJ process. We have a Vietnamese shrimping community. Um, so there's language barriers and challenges and communication that um, we uh, plan to kind of work directly with them. But then the social indicators tool and, and other mechanisms we're using, obviously, to um, best identify kind of underserved uh, communities in our region and uh, going to setting up the focus groups and going to them in order for um, the you know meetings to be successful and impactful. And uh, Puerto Rico is a great example where we had originally planned to do two focus groups, and the advice given to us was that we should expand that to four because the island of Puerto Rico can be very de different with regard to the demographics just based on whether you're on the north, south, east, or western side of the island. And so uh, we are working with many others in those communities, obviously, to kind of identify key stakeholders, constituents that we can work with with these focus groups. Oh, great. Okay. That's, thanks, thanks for answering that so thoroughly. At the very end, you said, um, there's a challenge to getting approval to collecting some of this data. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is, the, is that the Paper Reduction Act or are there other barriers to systematically collecting this type of information? Yeah, so I mentioned kind of in my uh, comments about with our permit system prior to it being online, um, when it was a paper-based system uh, and fishermen were filling out the demographic information or didn't fill it out, um, ultimately it was getting returned to them or holding up permits, right? So there was a decision made not to collect that or require that information to be collected. Um, more recently, you're correct, the Paperwork Reduction Act requirements for demographic information, my understanding is there may be limitations with regard regard to um, the information that we would be able to collect going forward in the future, even though we're authorized to collect that information now, uh, may be more limited in scope um, going forward. Uh, Stephen, and then Kaylin. Stephen. All right, thank you. Hey, Andy, thanks for the, the presentation, all the, the really helpful information. 
Um, I'm curious, you, you mentioned quite a bit the NOAA social indicators and, and their, their use for doing place-based you know, uh, comparisons. And at one point you, you commented on some potential changes to where they could be even more useful. And, and I believe you said something about like if they were um, selectable down to a, fish, a specific fishery context or something like that. I wondered if you just talk about that a little bit more and then from your unique spot of, of looking at three regions, if you had thoughts on if the, the types of changes in, in that context might be generally useful across those three regions, or if it's something that, that would need much more thought like within a region um, type, type approach. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Good to see you. Um, yeah, so what I mentioned was that the social indicators is at a place-based community level. Um, it's not available at a fishery or even, um, I'll say, underserved population level, right? So to the extent that we could have the data and be able to drill down further, right, when we're working on a fishery management plan or action related to a specific fishery, it would benefit, obviously, us in the decision-making process in evaluating the specific uh, benefits, impacts, um, that uh, that particular regulatory action decision would have um, on on that fishery or or that community or underserved you know population. So we just don't have that level of data to be able to drill down to that level. Um, in terms of your second question, I guess I'll I'll answer this more broadly. I mean, I think I, I mentioned it in my kind of earlier comments. You know, the challenge I see with the how equity and, and all of these mandates kind of get factored into the decision-making process is that there are a lot of um, mandates and requirements and it's a balancing act with the fishery management councils to reach a decision, right? And so uh, how does equity weigh with regard to a decision relative to ending overfishing relative to other mandates under the act uh, and having kind of more specific um, guidance, direction, um, you know, process uh, would, I think, be really beneficial. And I, I see that kind of across all three regions. Um, I think, you know, the, the interesting thing from my seat is with the Caribbean, um, there's substantial kind of equity issues with regard to kind of funding of fisheries science, resource and management in the Caribbean, just because the fisheries are smaller. Um, but from an equity standpoint of kind of how we work with them in the management process, they're probably the farthest along with regard to translators, bilingual communication, right? Um, opportunities to uh, more regularly interact with constituents um, at a very community level because of this smaller geographic area in which they're operating. So hope that answers your question. All right, and last but not least, Kaylin. I think you're starting to get close to answering the question I had. Um, I think this is a little bit of a variation of how um, additional information would fit into the management process. And you talked about specific management plans or actions, but I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about the difference between more qualitative information that you might be collecting versus more quantitative. So a lot of these indicators are very quantitative, but um, I thought it was interesting how you were describing um, some of these focus groups you're doing, and you could think about that as a scoping exercise, but also presumably you're learning about um, um, concerns people have or something about community composition maybe and things like that. And is, and is that something that you're grappling with or that people have talked about? I'll use an example that I hope you think is relevant. So in the Gulf of Mexico with our individual fishing quota programs, I mentioned earlier um, a little bit of kind of general frustration with regard to access and uh, ability to enter the fishery based on costs information. Right now, uh, we are working closely with the Fishery Management Council to review their goals and objectives for that program, right? They were primarily set in place 15 plus years ago to reduce overcapitalization, avoid derby fishing conditions, improve safety at sea, 
right? Now, 15 years have gone by and um, we've learned a lot from the programs, uh, similar to what my, the previous speaker was saying. And so we are um, first looking at kind of how do we um, update the goals and objectives and based on those decisions about how those goals and objectives are changed, we can then use quantitative or qualitative information to then shape um, decisions about equity uh, and uh, apportionment uh, for the fishery going forward. So I hope that helps. All right. Well, Andy, thank you very, very much for your time today. Um, it is uh, it is always interesting to find out more about these different re re regions. And I knew a fair amount about the South Atlantic and the Gulf, but not so much about the Caribbean. So I, I particularly enjoyed that and, and hearing the way you're facing some of the challenges with engaging communities who have who have not been historically involved um, in the management process, but but have been involved in fisheries themselves. I think that's been very helpful for the committee. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Um, we're going to continue the geographic hopscotch across the, the, the nation, and uh, uh, we've saved the biggest jump for last. I think we're, we're going to go from the uh, southeast um, all the way over to the uh, Pacific Island Regional Fisheries Office. Um, my agenda says Sarah Malloy, but uh, I'm not sure Sarah can make it with us today. So, um, Jared, are you are you running? You yes, here? yes, I am. Welcome. Thank um, you. Thank, thank you for for s stepping in. Um, I don't know how much of the previous conversations you've been able to listen into. Um, we have asked the presenters to tell us a little bit about the fisheries and, and the sort of management culture, uh, and, and then to offer some thoughts and comments on the general questions we ask without necessarily feeling obliged to answer every single question. And then we'll, um, we'll ask you some clarifying questions at the end of your presentation. So, Sherrod, sure. thanks very much for jo joining us. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, Sarah sends her regards that she was not able to make it. Um, for introduction purposes, my name is Jared Makayao. I am the regional uh, assistant regional administrator for sustainable fisheries here in the Pacific Islands. And I think a lot of you know about the Pacific Islands, but I'm gonna kind of go a little bit more into detail of the areas that we cover. Um, everyone's familiar with the state of Hawaii, very uh, sunny, sandy beaches and things like that. But we also have a large area of jurisdiction that also includes American Samoa down in the South Pacific. And if we uh, continue on towards our uh, Eastern path towards Japan, um, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas is another jurisdiction that we serve, uh, as well as the island of Guam. And so while we are sort of uh, spread across the Central and Western Pacific, uh, there are a lot of commonalities in terms of uh, the, the islands that we serve. Uh, a lot of uh, each one of them has its own uh, unique cultural history. Um, in Hawaii, uh, there's a, a, a relatively um, uh, intact uh, Native Hawaiian culture, uh, but we certainly have a lot of uh, Western influences. And Native Hawaiian population is about 20% of, of, of the Hawaiian uh, state of Hawaii's population. Now, if we go down to American Samoa, their culture is is almost entirely intact. 90% uh, of the residents there are indigenous native uh, Samoans, um, and they run their seat of government in their culture. Uh, so they kind of split the half with uh, part of it being Western uh, with a democracy, but they also have their uh, chief and matai system strongly in place and incorporated into government. Uh, as we move on to uh, the, the Northern Marianas and Guam, uh, they've been heavily impacted from uh, you know, immigration um, going back all the way to the 15th century with the Spanish uh, um, uh, visits there. And so their population has been uh, fairly uh, reduced, um, but there are still a lot of 
uh, part uh, Chamorros, uh, as well as Carolinians who have uh, moved up from uh, down in Micronesia into Guam and Saipan when uh, the Chamorros were sort of, their population was uh, diminished. Um, so uh, aside from Hawaii, I think the three island territories of Guam, uh, the Northern Marias and America Samoa are largely represented by their native populations. Uh, on our fishery management councils, uh, the representatives from the, from the, that hold the seats uh, from the state governments, as well as the governor nominees, are, are generally native island, islanders by blood. And so their, uh, their perspectives uh, are, are largely represented uh, in the council discussions and, and decisions. Um, and so that's sort of like a, a general overview of our region, uh, as well as our, our composition. Uh, lastly, I'll just say in Hawaii, uh, while we do have a, a lot of mixing of populations, uh, a lot of the Hawaiian cultural values are still um, recognized uh, in our state constitutions. Uh, the way that uh, Native Hawaiians have managed their uh, resources, a lot of that has been incorporated into the the state management system. So uh, it's certainly the, the, the concepts of, of traditional management is still alive and well in, in all of our jurisdictions. Now, when I move into the sort of the overview of our commercial fisheries, uh, I kind of wrestled with what to present. Um, and I think I'm just gonna present with uh, what is the largest fisheries first. Um, the largest fisheries that we have in the Pacific Islands region is our pelagic longline fisheries. Uh, these are uh, two separate fisheries. They're based in Hawaii, um, as well as one down in American Small. But I'll start with Hawaii. We have a deep set tuna fishery. Um, these vessels are about 65 to 100 feet in length. Uh, we have 165 permits available, of which about 150 are active. Uh, the fleet catches about 26 uh, million pounds of tuna and other pelagic resources every year. Uh, their ex-vessel revenue is about $109 million. So it is by far our largest fishery in the Pacific. Uh, the composition of the fleet are largely uh, Vietnamese American, European American, uh, and Korean American. Very few Native Hawaiians participate in the fishery. Uh, the crew are mostly foreign. Uh, and one of the reasons why is that um, going on these vessels are about three, three weeks out at sea. Uh, a lot of people don't really like to be out sea, at least the native uh, 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 people from Hawaii. So uh, the fleet really has to look afar for crew to work on these vessels. And we get most of our information on the demographics and composition uh, from uh, interviews that our fishery science center conducts uh, when we're doing cost, uh, cost set uh, um, surveys. Uh, the second largest fleet that we have in the Pacific Islands uh, in terms of uh, volume and value uh, is the shallow set swordfish fishery. Again, uh, this is sort of a component of the longline fishery where uh, vessels during certain seasons, a smaller number of them, about 20, will jump off of the deep set tuna fishery and move into the swordfish fishery, which generally operates between October to March every year. Uh, in terms of uh, catch, it's, it's much smaller. Uh, 1.3 million uh, pounds uh, in 2021. Uh, the revenue is just shy of about uh, $5 million. Uh, and the demographics are largely Vietnamese American, uh, although some of the other uh, ethnicities, European American and Korean, Korean American, some of them uh, go into those uh, fisheries as well, but a very small amount. They're, they're primarily the Vietnamese Americans that, that do this fishery. Uh, when we do uh, look down to the South Pacific in American Samoa, we also have another pelagic longline fishery that targets albacore. Uh, and these are the kind of uh, uh, tunas that you'll get in the can. Whereas uh, in the Hawaii, uh, the tunas are, are mainly for fresh seafood, uh, sashimi and poke markets. Um, American Samoa has about uh, 60 vessels in, in the permit uh, program. Uh, unfortunately, only 11 of them are active, and there's a combination of, you know, global uh, market issues uh, and, and and just economics uh, make it very difficult for the fleet to to be viable. And we are concerned that this fleet 
may go away uh, just because they, they're not being uh, able to, to, to fish sufficiently um, keep revenue streams moving forward. Uh, it's about 2.3 million pounds of albacore fish caught every year. The value of the fishery is uh, about half of what the swordfish fishery is, about 2.5 million pounds. And the fleet de demographics are, are almost all uh, American Samoans, uh, either Native American Samoans or expats that have moved from the States uh, into American Samoa. So I'd say about 90% of the fleet is uh, American Samoan. Now those are our big, our big commercial fish, and we we say big in, in relatively relative terms to other fisheries of the nation. But um, our other commercial fisheries, which in terms of number of participants, uh, the largest we have is pelagic troll and handline fisheries, and so these are small boat fisheries, generally vessels uh, about less than 50 feet, uh, ranges about you know. 15 to 50, 60, 60 foot, uh, and they go. They are day trippers. They 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 um, trailer boat uh, to different parts of the island, uh, drop their vessels in, into the water, and you know troll for you know about six to eight hours and come back to shore. And so all the island areas have uh, these uh, pelagic troll fisheries. Uh, in Hawaii, there's about 1,500 vessels. Uh, in Guam, there's about 500 vessels. In the Northern Marianas, there's about about 100 vessels. Uh, and American Samoa is the smallest, which is about five vessels. And um, Hawaii has by far the largest uh, fleet, uh, as well as catches. They they average about 2.5 million pounds of fish a year. Uh, the revenues are generally shy of $10 million. Um, and for the other island areas, these they're very small. Um, the data sets that we rely on for these fisheries are collected by the states and territories. Uh, so we have no federal permit or reporting requirements for pelagic troll and handline fisheries. Uh, all of the data streams are collected um, through the uh, various uh, local resource management agencies. Hawaii is the only one that has a sort of a license system. All the other island areas are a completely voluntary krill surveys. Um, and that's Kind of a um, oh, I, from a fisheries management standpoint, it's it's unfortunate that the the, the, the local territories have not adopted a, a a mandatory permit data collection system. So data is all done by surveys, which makes it difficult for uh, accuracy uh, in terms of uh, you know how many people are fishing, uh, what are they catching, and even the sales data um, are done through surveys through vendors. So. Um, that gives you a little bit of a, of a taste of the pelagic fisheries. Uh, in terms of uh, for hire, that's also a difficult one. In the state of Hawaii, um, they've defined every uh, vessel that takes passengers for hire as a commercial fishing operation. Um, so everyone that's on board that vessel, um, while the captain and the crew are commercial, uh, the catch is commercial as well. Um, and so the data that we get is just all commercial. Um, and so that, that's sort of wrapped up into the revenue for Hawaii, about $9 million, of, of which a portion of that is from our, what we call the charter sector, passenger for hire sector. Um, let's see. Um, I, I don't know if, should I stop for a second or should I just continue to roll on through the presentation and take questions after? Um, I think you should just wrap up. I think people are uh, sort of interested in hearing the whole story before we, we break for questions, but there will be time for questions at the end. Okay, great. So how have we considered equity into our decision-making process? So largely, as I mentioned before, each of the, uh, the, the representatives of, of the territories, uh, America, Small, Guam, and Northern Marianas, really bring to the council decision-making process uh, the perspectives of the local territories. Um, in Hawaii, uh, while council members may not necessarily be of indigenous native Hawaiian blood, uh, a lot of the cultural parts of fishing are really rooted in the native Hawaiian culture and practices. So a lot of those perspectives are, are, are brought forward uh, regardless of who the council members are. Um, 
in Hawaii and most of the islands, uh, the traditional fishing has been trolling and hand lining for pelagic species, as well as some uh, near shore bottom uh, snappers and groupers. And so by large, the, 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 the number of participants uh, are uh, of native traditional uh, islanders are really focused in, the, in those pelagic and troll and handline fisheries. And so a, a lot of that is, um, as I mentioned, mentioned by the, the state. When we get into the pelagic longline fisheries, this is a fishery which requires a lot of revenue and uh, capital to get uh, started in. Um, all of them are limited access fisheries, which means there is a finite number of permits. In Hawaii, our 165 permits were initially issued based on historical participation in the fishery. And at that time, you had a lot of uh, local Japanese who really uh, were the, the, the practitioners who brought longline fishing to Hawaii. And so a lot of the local Japanese uh, had, had obtained those permits. As time went on, the, the permits uh, became freely transferable. Uh, and so people who were moving out of the fishery uh, started to find a market. Hey, I could sell my permit uh, to someone who has been crewing my vessel. And so that's how a lot of different uh, uh, ethnicities moved into it from the European American, as well as uh, some of the um, uh, migration from the Vietnamese that were sort of uh, displaced from other longline fisheries in the U continental United States, as well as down in the south in, in shrimp fisheries, came over to Hawaii to engage in, in pelagic longline fisheries. So that's where you get some of the Vietnamese and as well as some of the Koreans. Uh, today, uh, a market value for a Hawaii longline limited entry permit is about three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars, and these are sort of done uh, through brokerage brokers. Uh, in the industry. And so native Hawaiians uh, obviously uh, are at a disadvantage because uh, they are a smaller population. They are socioeconomically uh, the, the lowest in terms of uh, uh, home ownership, job markets, and things like that. So uh, this is by far out of reach for most Native Americans, uh, excuse me, Native Hawaiians. Uh, in American Samoa, um, they saw what happened in Hawaii. And so when they created their limited entry program, they again, uh, initially, they liked the part about historical participation because American Samoa, almost all the participants were native, uh, native Samoans. Uh, what they differed is the permit eligibility and transfers and new issuance. They did not like the free market system. And so they really clamped down on that. And so in order to get a permit, you'd have to, have a participation in the fishery or get some native uh, uh, Samoan who, who did participate to be part of your organization. So uh, they really did not want to see what happened in Hawaii where uh, the fishery exploded with a lot of non-locals. Non and so they really uh, kept that permit uh, system, uh, the eligibility criteria to the advantage of, of the local citizenship. Um, in pelagic troll and handline fisheries, um, these are full open access. There are no federal permits required to participate. Um, the states, again, don't have any limited entry. So the, the only real, I guess, barrier to participating in this is, is having a boat. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a lot of different ways that people can get a boat. Um, so um, in terms of the federal fishery management, I think our focus uh, really into getting participation would be in our uh, longline fisheries because the other fisheries, um, you know, we, we still pay attention to them, but there, there's no real federal barriers to participating uh, except for capital. And so we are looking at different ways of, of providing capital to underserved communities um, to, to those other fisheries. Um, now, I think one of the questions is, uh, what information could equity considerations rely on? Uh, and that's a difficult one for us here. Uh, although we have a lot of native uh, peoples, uh, there are no federally recognized indigenous groups or tribes. Uh, and so, you know, what we really have to do is look at demographic data that are collected by uh, the state organizations. Uh, uh, there's a lot of communities that are comprised of to predominantly native indigenous peoples. Uh, minorities or other underserved communities. We don't collect a lot of that information through our permit systems. Uh, 
Uh, we do collect some of that information through all of the fisheries, whether it's federally managed or not, through uh, surveys that the, our fishery science center uh, conducts. Um, we do get surveys on perspectives of, of natives participations in, in some of these other fisheries. Um, and so, it, it, although there's been a big push uh, uh, from NOAA to sort of uh, look at equity, environmental justice, um, I think a lot of, in the Pacific Islands, that has always been sort of the focus. Um, a lot of the conversations have been driven by the native indigenous groups and the membership of the council. So I think it's something that we've always lived with, but I think we could continue to fine tune. And, and part of our environmental uh, EEJ strategy is, is to looking into what more of these communities would like to see, not in terms of management, because I think they have access to those fisheries, um, and, and they appreciate that the federal government is not managing the pelagic troll and handline fisheries. Um, and so, you know, we always say, hey, be careful what you ask for, because as, as federal entities, our job is to, you know, manage the resource, which usually means restricting activities that you have traditionally done. And so what we're really hearing from communities is more, uh, you know, opportunities to participate in grant programs how to be more competitive in grants, how to see more federal funding come to the territories to support fisheries development through grants and other means. And so that's where our most of the, the requests for uh, assistance ha has been uh, given to us from, from local communities. Now I wanna to touch on something that we've done um, to get towards uh, further uh, participation uh, by underserved local communities. The Magnuson-Stevens Act uh, has a section uh, for both the Pacific Islands as well as the uh, Alaska uh, to provide communities with access to fisheries that have, they have traditionally depended upon but may not have had the capabilities to support continued and substantial participation, possibly due to economic, regulatory, and other barriers. And so there's a carve out in Magnuson that allows NIMS to work with the councils to develop programs that really get at putting native peoples into fisheries that they have, uh, that they participated but don't necessarily participate in today. So there's two components to this program that we, we have. One is a community development program that provides the council the authority to develop regulatory programs that might uh, promote uh, the participation in fisheries. And some of the things that we've, we've discussed that haven't really come to fruition yet, but is to reserve a certain amount of permits. Um, it could be the uh, long line permit. Uh, reserve a certain amount of permits that is uh, commensurate to the, the indigenous population and reserve those permits for the native Hawaiian population. So uh, as I mentioned, the Hawaii long line fishery has 165 permits. They're looking into ways that where we could reserve a certain number of those permits for indigenous peoples. Now, even though you reserve a permit to participate in the fishery, you need a vessel, you need capital. And a lot of the communities don't have that. So the second component to the Western Pacific Community Development Program is a demonstration project program. And this is a grant program that provides funds to eligible Western Pacific communities uh, to demonstrate traditional cultural fisheries and fishery practices. And so these are fundings. In the past, we've been able to purchase uh, vessels for communities that wanna engage in uh, uh, training uh, their uh, uh, adolescents and, and younger adults in participating in tr uh, pelagic troll and handline and, and skipjack fisheries. Um, and so that's where a lot of our focus has, has been going. Uh, one of the issues we are finding is that as, as funds uh, dry up, discretion, and these are discretionary programs. Uh, we haven't been able to fund these programs uh, in the recent time. So I think, um, you know, I, I'm not going to touch on these other questions because I think uh, I'm not really sure if it's sort of applicable to us, but we certainly are looking at ways to pr promote further outreach of who these communities are, who's interested in participating in the fisheries that we manage. Um, uh, and, and to really try and promote that. Um, but I, you know, personally, as well as what we see, uh, fishermen are happy 
that the federal government is not actively managing the fisheries that they really participate in. Uh, so they say, hey, thank you very much, uh, but you know, you keep your federal regulations to yourself and we'll continue to, to conduct our pelagic troll and handline fisheries uh, and we'll let you know when we need you. Um, so I think that's where I'll, I'll sort of wrap up and um, I'm open to questions on any of those uh, topics. Well, Jared, first of all, thank, thank you very much for, for giving us an overview of both the cultural importance of the fisheries and, and the region's efforts to uh, account for those cultural differences. Um, one of the themes we've heard from a lot of the presenters you raised as well, and, and um, someone said it's a, sort of the problem of those who are not in the room, please ra ra raise your hand. Um, <laughs> so I, I wonder if you can talk through your efforts to do that, because your early comments suggested that you may have been more connected to um, cultural communities um, than, than the other regions have been. So, so, so what do you think are the particular challenges the Western Pacific region faces and, and how are you going about reaching out to those communities? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think, you know, sometimes you can get, uh, you know, lost in, in your myopic views as, hey, we, we're a council. Uh, we have representatives from, from the territories. Uh, the council has advisory panels that really tr try and find who's participating in the fisheries to represent these advisory panels. So a lot of the effort is done by the council um, going down into the communities and, and trying to literally beat the bush going into holding uh, meetings and talking with people who is interested in, in you know, participating in this process. The issue we have is that we're not managing the fisheries that you know, a lot of the, the native peoples uh, in the islands participate in. Um, a, a lot of them, we're, we're basically the top of undersea volcanoes and a lot of the fisheries uh, are coral reef fisheries which are really inshore, um, you know, from the shoreline to about, uh, you know, 100, 200, 300 feet deep. Um, and they, they simply don't exist in the federal waters. And so that's a difficult one for us where the majority of the people are not participating uh, in our federal fisheries. So we'll continue to go down to the territories and say, hey, we, we're managing this fisheries. And uh, in, in American Samoa, they're very participatory because they are the majority of the, of the federal fishery participants. In Hawaii, the territories uh, of Sinai and Guam, it's a lot more difficult to get people to, to come up because uh, your federal fishery management council, where do you guys manage? What do you, what do you manage? Well, we, don't, we don't do that. Uh, and you don't, you don't manage us. So, um, so I, I guess uh, going back to your question, what does the outreach look like? The outreach really looks like you know, people on the ground. We have representatives that, that live there that are integrated in the community and really just trying to keep ourselves relevant in the federal fisheries. And um, if they're interested in, in, in developing them, uh, longline fishing development has been something we've been looking into. There are people that have been interested, but has never really taken off in, in Sinai and Guam. Rachel. Yeah, thanks, Jared. This is super interesting. So when when did limited entry come in in the Hawaiian fishery? I'm trying to track how American Samoa learned their lessons from the... Yeah, a uh, Hawaii limited entry program uh, began in the uh, 1990s. And there was okay. a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, Longline fisheries could come up virtually to the shoreline before. And so you had a lot of uh, conflicts between uh, the long line vessels, which would lay out, you know, 40, 40 miles of line and the pelagic troll fishery, which are, are primarily the local residents. And, and they would run over each other's lines. They would shoot at each other. Uh, and so two things happened. One, to limit the number of long liners that could come to Hawaii. And number two was to push them far offshore. Uh, so we did eventually push them 15 nautical miles from shore 
uh, so that the, the local troll and handline could have a relatively free zone where they, and that's the sort of the, the outer limits of their range. Um, so they, they could continue to practice unencumbered by longline vessels. And American Samoa started about uh, 2002, so about 20 years later um, that they, they saw the possibility of influx. So they started seeing foreign, foreign vessels coming in and trying to get permits. And we, we would be issuing permits. Uh, they would partner with someone and they, they didn't want to see that happen uh, like Hawaii did. Gotcha. And could I ask just a couple more clarifying questions around, could you, could you better explain, I, I'm, I'm struggling with the disconnect between, sounded like there's efforts to reserve a number of permits. So, you know, the Alaska CDQ program is a portion of the TAC, but it sounded like you were talking about the Western Pacific CDQ program as like a portion of permits to support like active participation. Is that fair? Yes, it's fair. We, we've had we had several limited entry programs, and the first attempt was at a bottom fish. Our northwestern Hawaiian Island bottom fish fishery had 17 permits, and this fishery no longer exists because of uh, the Papahānaumokuākea Marine National Monument. Um, there were 17 permits, uh, and the council was looking at reserving 20% of those permits for Native Hawaiians. And while the council was going through the rulemaking action, uh, the president declared a monument and, and killed the fishery essentially. So that died. Um, so the council started to look at the longline fisheries, like the next limited entry system where they could reserve the permit. What the council ran into with that fishery was the fair market value of the permit was at the time about 200 to 300,000. Now it's gone to 400,000. And the thought was if you wanted to take permits away, uh, NIMS would have to buy those permits back first. And so I think that caused a, a, a halt in the thinking. Do we have the, the money to buy, you know, 20% of those permits? And I think the, the answer was no, we don't. Uh, and so we're, the council is still trying to find different ways of, of looking at how it could, um, you know, re either reserve or have some sort of partnership where more native Hawaiians could enter that fishery. Okay, gotcha. And it's the carve out that it means that you guys don't have to necessarily deal with um, differentiating between residents of different states. That's what's kind of yeah. protecting that local access. That does. Yeah. I mean, that's always been an issue for us about creating programs that would uh, violate national standard. Um, and so finding ways, uh, there's been some ways thought about it. Yeah. Um, communities, um, uh, and the eligibility criteria that's in, in, in that Western Pacific uh, development program uh, might help. You have to be uh, a, a, a resident or descended from a resident of the indigenous populations of, of, this, uh, of, of the Pacific Islands. Um, that one's questionable as well. So, uh, you know, we haven't gotten into too much legal, but national standard versus, you know, a specific language in the Magnuson that seems to counter each other. Gotcha. Okay. And then you've got good demographic data on fleet participation or permit holdings. Are they all residents of Hawaii? No, they're not. Uh, in the longline fishery, uh, we have permit holders across uh, the Western states. Uh, there are some, in, in other, the majority are from Hawaii, but um, okay. we do have uh, permit holders from Western states. They're not a lot. I would say about 10 or so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for- Everyone is American, for. right? All the, all the fishes are American. It's just a quick follow up, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Grant, please go ahead. Yeah, Jared, thanks for that. Um, I wanted to go back to the separation or lack of thereof between the four higher and commercial fisheries and, and just make sure I understood that properly. I, I think I heard you say that their four higher landings are recorded as commercial, so we really can't separate out how much that sector is taking versus commercial. Are the permits also lumped together or are the permits separate, designated separately? 
Yeah. So um, no, they're 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 not separated. I um, every charter vessel owner operator in the state of Hawaii has to get a commercial license from the state, um, but they can demarcate. You know, it's a charter operation. So uh, of the 3,000, 3,500 uh, commercial uh, fishermen in, in Hawaii. Um, I want to say uh, we could tease out how much of those are charter for hire of uh, vessels. Okay. And then in theory, we could link that to, I mean, it would be extra work, but link that to landings. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That could be, that, that can be teased out. Okay. Thanks. Um, I want uh, Rashid, please go ahead. Yeah, so so the the permits, uh, do they have are they permanent permits? Are they do they have a life lifespan? You know, and uh, depending on your answer, that could build in some flexibility, right? Could you, are they could you permits forever? I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. No, I, I think I I, I I I missed your question. My question is: those permits you mentioned, uh, are they permanent? I want you to give them out. Are they giving out for permits? Uh, they they have to they have to apply for it every year. It's an annual every review. year. Uh -huh. Every year. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that builds uh, quite a bit of flexibility, maybe. Yes. Does it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I think so. Yeah. And. In Hawaii, it's because it's a freely transferable. Um, mm -hmm. they, they change a lot um, for business reasons, for other reasons. Uh, we we mm -hmm. will issue a permit to someone, and they will move it to someone else. Uh, and and it's it's very difficult to track, but uh, we have that we have that information, and we're mm -hmm. we're starting to build a longer term database so we can follow this permit through. The hands it changes to. Okay. Yeah. No cash shares, right? Do you have cash shares? No cash species? shares. Not, uh, not yet. We've okay, had workshops shares. on cash shares, and so mm. far the industry has been reluctant to do it. Uh, I think mm. they, they do fear uh, a consolidation uh, if yeah. that goes into place. And so they're they're really reluctant to, to go to cash shares. Yeah. yeah, understandable to some extent. Yeah, thank you. I want to take uh, once again. I want to thank Jared for for his presentation and his thoughtful answers to our questions. We have sort of fifteen or twenty minutes left. Um, that was to be a Q and A with with the regional administrators. As you know, many of them were unable to stay on for the duration of the call, but. Uh, I wanted to take this time to, to, first of all, see if there were any broader questions from members of the committee that sort of cross the um, briefings that we've heard today. Kaylin made the point in one of her questions, I think when we were dealing with the Pacific about movement into the Alaska region and that we've sort of, by doing this series of presentations region by region, we tend to silo it. So I, I want to give the opportunity uh, for any questions about lessons learned across the endeavor um, and also the opportunity for particular follow-up questions um, from the committee or from other members of the audience. That cannot be possible. No question, no comment. <laughs> Stacy, <laughs> please go ahead. Thanks, Tom. I'll just take a moment because um, you know, I was trying to jot down as we went along, but there were several requests for um documentation of some of the things that we heard. Um, so I'll just take a moment first to, to sort of reiterate your thanks, Tom, to our uh, speakers today, and also just to ask if um, if each of them could just provide 
you know, any supporting documents for the for the questions that were asked today or for the um, the points that were made. And uh, certainly, please expect that we will follow up with some of the specific requests um, that were made. But I just thought I'd put a plug out there preemptively uh, for any you know documents that you think might lend themselves to supporting what we've heard today. Thank you, Stacey. Rachel. Yeah, I just wanted to put this out to um, our guests that are still on the line. So we've heard across regions about this um, community social vulnerability index or the, this set of indicators. And I'm just curious from your regions, are there any compelling examples where, where you've seen that this suite of indicators has been helpful in terms of informing a, a council analysis to improve equity or, or to take into account um, maybe underserved populations? Are there, or has, you know, in addition to that, I guess, if you have any thoughts on additional indicators that might help your region in this arena? And I know that's probably a difficult question to answer on the fly, but when I when I review that set of indicators, it looks like, and we were just talking about this, like it looks like they're still somewhat siloed in terms of here's the fishery dependent indicators, and here's the underserved communities, but they're I don't necessarily know if and how they overlap to show kind of the how it all ties together in terms of uh, informing. An analysis. Rachel, I apologize. Were you directing that at me or someone else? I kind of just put it, I just put it out there. It's kind of an open floor. I'm just wondering across um, across regions how that's utilized. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not the expert certainly with social indicators and the EJ tool, but what I would say is I think your assessment's fairly spot on, right? In terms of there's certainly kind of limitations with regard to um, how it is used versus kind of the kind of initial intent uh, and purpose developed for the tool. And that's where I get back to my comments about kind of better guidance kind of consideration for the councils to utilize tools like that and information to um, reach decisions. Okay, yeah, thanks so much. I, I was looking for more. I just wanted to make sure I had a good understanding of how it's used and how it might be improved. Um, this is Frank. I, I was able to return um, from the West Coast region and, um, and, and I think, you know, Andy's response is is great. Maybe I'll just add a little bit. It, to me, it gets back to that kind of question that I think I heard from all the people uh, that you know, identify or trying to address equity. It you you have to kind of know <laughs> to whom you're trying to give equity and and what the kind of the problems are, and that's hard to identify. You know, uh, and to me, it always goes back. I mean, the council process is an open process, and so. Um, uh, you know, that's, I think, why all of us said we're, we're looking at identifying those underserved communities to potentially uh, address that. But I think, you know, Andy hit it spot on that, that the tools were designed for a specific purpose based on what we knew then, not necessarily for addressing all the equity concerns. So, um, so thank you, Frank. Uh, Rashid. Yeah, so uh, uh, a quick kind of reaction to Frank's comment now. You know, the, it's hard. Uh, it's hard, like you said, to identify these groups, you know. But maybe uh, some little efforts could actually activate people, you know, here on campus um, at UBC, where we are university city, there's accommodation here that people can, other university people or non-university people can live on campus. And they, they have signs, they, they put in signs around the campus. And the, the sign is, Everyone can live here. I mean, it's it's quite funny. Just that statement, right? 
uh, makes a big difference to people who, who think that, hey, this fishery is not, it's not for us for historical reasons. So there might be some little efforts that can be done like that. Just say, I know it's an open process, but some people have been excluded and they feel I'm not part of this. So somehow we can do, that's a little kind of from experience here. Now, regarding the, yeah, listening to all of you is really quite informative. I learned a lot. Uh, mainly because maybe I don't know much about all the regional uh, uh, management council. So this is great. But what I came up with, with is that there, there's likely to be a lot of learning across these regional councils from what I heard from you. Almost each one of you can learn, could learn from, from the other. And I know there are differences peculiar to, to regions and that has to be taken into account. So my question, and something that you don't need to do here, I think is if there's one thing you can put out there that you think could be learned from your council by the others, and that's question number one. If there is one thing you want them to stay away with if they want to achieve equity. So these two things could be very helpful for the committee, I think, as we shape our work and, and come up with something reasonable. Thank you. I, I think those are interesting points, Rashid, the, particularly the point about learning across the councils, because mm -hmm. they are experiments in a way, right, in their re region. They all have a different flavor, a, a different, they develop different sets of traditions for how they, they op, 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 operate. And, and so I suspect there is learning. So one of the ways learning occurs is if the councils and the regional offices talk to one another. And mm -hmm. I know from discussions with Mike Pen Pentony that he had just come back from a series of meetings in Washington with all the regional administrators. So, so how often do you guys get together mm -hmm. in a structured way like, like that? Is that an infrequent occurrence? or a frequent occurrence where inter-council discussions occur or inter-office mm. discussions occur? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll jump in, Tom. Um, so we have a leadership council that you were referencing from Mike Pending that meets twice a year in person, um, usually once in Washington, D.C., once in the region. We also have um, what's called the council uh, CCC, Council Coordinating Committee, right? That meets twice a year. In fact, there's a meeting coming up in about a week and a half here in the Southeast. And that's where all the regional fishery management councils as well as regional administrators attend. So we have at least four meetings a year in person. And then uh, the regional administrators, uh, we have a, a regularly scheduled meeting that uh, is done at least monthly uh, every six weeks. Uh, Plus, we have just regular scheduled calls with one another. So there's a lot of cross-sharing and information um, that we can learn from one another. And certainly for, for my region in the Southeast, right, I work more closely with Mike Pentney and Sarah Malloy because of the issues that we're facing both in the Caribbean as well as on the Atlantic seaboard than maybe the other regions. But there's a lot of coordination. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. I think it's helpful to know those structures exist were the were the were this committee to make some recommendations about structured le, 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 learning to be able to comment more intelligently about how that might occur. Mm. I, I was particularly taken by the community development quotas in yeah. Alaska, which seemed to be, a, a, and I'd not come across them before, but it seemed a particularly mm -hmm. um, interesting way to ensure community engagement. Ha, has that been one of the consequences of that, that, that the CDQs has, have driven broader participation in the fishery management process, or is it still small groups from within each C, 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 CDQ. 
And I don't think Gretchen was able to stay on. So that was mm. a question that may not have an answer. Yeah, just not here. Other thoughts, questions, comments? Grant. Yeah, I think this is maybe a, similar to what uh, Rashid was asking, but um, I'm interested in data coordination as well. It seems to me that one of the common threads across these regions was the permit itself. Uh, how similar are the permit applications in the different regions? Do they ask the same questions? Are they widely different? Are they idiosyncratic to each region or are they similar? And a related question is there, there also seems to be ad hoc for lack of a better word, initiatives in the different regions are shorter term, less comprehensive, more historically contingent efforts in each of those regions. Have there been efforts to sort of compare and contrast those as well? And are they similar or different? Or are they like, are they idiosyncratic, which is the impression I, I kind of got. So long story short, are, do the permit applications look the same in the different regions for one and two, or do these ad hoc efforts compare to one another? Maybe I'll start off a little bit here. Um, and uh, so in, in the West Coast region, back when I was ARA, I mean, we did have the new cat shares program and developed kind of a new permit for that. Um, we did look at other regions um, and, and think about that. So I, I think there is a lot of overlap. But there's also a little bit of idiosync idiosyncraticness. I don't know what the right word is there, but uh, you know that we each have our own needs uh, that we need to address, and and that adds just a little bit of difference. But I think they're largely very similar in the in the information that they gather. Um, at, at least that was you know when we specifically looked at that, we did look at a few other regions uh permit uh, application forms and and we copied a lot of it but you know um I'll, i think i'll stop there hi this is jared i'll, I'll just jump in uh, where frank left off i i agree the, the there are some basic uh data fields that are going to be collected uh on permits across uh the regions uh but there are some differences uh that each region has and you know in the discussions of, of, of a national permit we have a national permit system um, that headquarters runs and each of the regions uh, I think most of the regions contribute to uh, but the, the permit system itself doesn't is not flexible enough to accommodate all the needs of the different regions so uh, some regions have created their own permit system just because the the, the fields are different so uh, Short answer, Graham, there's some similarities. There are a lot of differences, but I don't know if anyone's gone through and, and taken a look across the board of, of, of where it is. And I think if someone does, and it'd be very helpful for us to, to build a national permit system where it can accommodate everyone's needs. Uh, it, it doesn't really have to, Jarad, you know? I mean, just having the information make it available, people can see across the board, you pick up elements that will help you, and that's good enough, right? It can lead to improvements, but clearly it will be hard to have one system that applies everywhere. Ah, that, that will not be the goal, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, so just a quick response before I invite Ra Rachel to ask a question. I, I think it is fine if you view the regions as the siloed centers, but if there's a lot of exchange, then the more similarity you get, the more you can leverage the data that comes in through that system. Rachel. Yeah, um, so I'm most familiar with Alaska and issues like barriers to entry and the graying of the fleet and things like that are often um, front and center. And I think we've heard, you know, some of that today in, in the presentations. And I'm curious with the current data you have available is rate of new entrance already something that's collected or easily accessible or the residency of new entrance? Is that something that could be 
it's already kind of known across regions in terms of who's entering the fisheries and where they might call home. I think the residency issue might be up in the air for some, but would you guys know that through quota holdings or permit holdings across regions? Um, I can, was, as part of the, the five-year review for the cashier program, this was, there was some exploration of this. And once again, it's a difficult question because what is a new entrant? Is this somebody that owns quota, somebody that has a permit, or is it a crew member? Uh, and once again, I, th I heard a couple other people say, you know, getting I, uh, um, a good handle on crew members is very difficult. Um, and um, we could potentially, it's it probably not that difficult to see new permit holders. We could probably figure that out pretty, pretty quickly. But it's, um, if they're, you know, the brother of the former permit holder is at a new entrant, you know, uh, or a family person, you know, those kind of questions come up. Uh, and then, like I said, the crew members is very hard. And and I think I also said there were some voluntary surveys that were be done by a couple of the centers on the West Coast, but that it would be hard to kind of expand that to get a really good idea of new entrants. So it's a difficult question. And I'll just add to Frank's comments. I think Frank has said it well. Um, the, the, the main information we would have is really down at the permit level, right? In terms of assessing who's applied for a new permit, who didn't maybe exist in our database previous to that. The challenge is that if we're talking just permits, it's limited access fisheries that that's primarily helpful for, primarily our commercial fisheries. In the Southeast, we have some open access permits, for example, our South Atlantic for hire permit where people may come and go, have lots of entities that apply for permits from other regions that may have no intent of using them. And then our private recreational sector is permitted uh, at the state level with many exceptions in terms of permit holdings, but uh, we don't have anything analogous to uh, the permit data for private recreational anglers in the Southeast, which represent a good portion of our catch. Gotcha. So if I'm understanding you, you could technically look at new entrants for a year and, and compare it to existing, you know, within the years long duration of whatever program was implemented. And you say this may person, this person may have never held quota since the program was created, but in defining whether or not it, it, that person constitutes a new entrant based on if they were crew, if they have family relationships, that's where the nuances is where it kind of gets lost. Is that what I was hearing? Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Matthew. Yeah, I was wondering if you guys could just speak to why collecting information from crew is hard. Is it just simply because of a lack of resources that would prevent or that gets that makes it challenging to collect something that you haven't historically collected or is there just something fundamentally challenging for getting information from crew members um you know for example through like just i mean again i know in, in alaska at least for for crew you typically have to register or get like a license through fish and game um so why is it hard Well, I can't speak for other regions, but I think what you just said is why it's hard for us, at least currently in the Southeast, is we don't have a commensurate system that requires them to have licenses for crew members in the Southeast. We permit the vessel, uh, the vessel owner, but not necessarily the crew members themselves. And I can add a little bit for, for the West Coast, same thing, there's no crew requirement. And in addition, um, besides the, the, you know, factory vessels, um, the crew, while there's a lot of kind of continuity, uh, for, for a lot of vessels, it also changes, you know, people will be called at the last second, you know, to become crew. Uh, and, and so, you know, how would you get access to that information, you know, and, uh, uh, we did at one point under the cashier program uh, talk about you know requiring crew uh information to be um uh sent in uh and there were just uh, we, you know 
under APA, we have to have explain why we need it. And it was difficult to kind of explain why we needed it in, in a way to actually actively manage the program. So um, not to say that the, you couldn't make a case for that, but at that point in time, given everything else that was going on, we never did make that requirement. And so I, I think it's, you know, a, again, a combination of things. Um, and uh, it's, it's just, you know, to consistently get crew information is, is very difficult. May I add one more perspective for the Pacific Islands? Um, in our long line permits, uh, we have a lot of companies. A lot of them are family owned, but we have a pretty good portion of them that are limited liability corporations that kind of move around. Uh, and so in the permit itself, you would see the name of the company that we would issue the permit to. But in order to know who it is and whether or not they have an, a disproportionate number of shares in the fishery, you really have to dig deeper into some of the other information, like who's on the board of directors, how has that changed over time? Um, some of the vessels have, uh, there's there's a loophole within our system that allows uh, a dual Hawaii and American Samoa permit holder to catch big eye tuna that it won't be counted towards the US limit. And so there's a lot of companies that have been created uh, to get a permit uh, and then you really have to look at the board of directors to see who's moved around. Um, so it does get a little daunting after a while, but we do have all of that information. But to go back to the question, can you track entrance, new entrance to the fishery? Uh, yeah, if you consider a new company that they just created a year ago as a new entrant, uh, yes. But if you look at the board of directors, same guys, uh, maybe no. <laughs> All right. Uh, I appreciate everyone's indulgence. Stephen, did you have a question? Your hand was up. I was going to give you the last word. Sure. I mean, Jared answered a lot of it right there, but I, I was just going to go back to one of the points Gretchen made in her presentation about Alaska and mentioned that she noted um, owner on board as kind of an equity focused policy that had been developed there. And I was going to ask um, how difficult it would be to assess owner on board in the various regions, but it sounds like from Jared's comments there, even in that system, it'd be very difficult because of the structure of individuals versus, you know, corporations. Um, so if anyone has any additional thoughts on that, um, I think that seems to be something that's important in the equity lens, but seems quite challenging to look at if I'm, if I'm reading the various responses. I'll just quickly comment. I think it could be done in our region, but it would take some work and it, we're not automatically set up to do that. It would not be just push a button off or a spreadsheet thing. It would take some considerable staff time to figure out how to do that. All right. Well, um, on behalf of everyone on the committee, um, Jared, Andy, Frank, uh, and those who have spoken to us earlier but had to leave. Thank you all very much for your time today. We appreciate um, making your time available to us. We know how busy your timetables are. I know I personally have learned a huge amount that will inform my thinking on this top topic. Um, as I said in my introductory comments, you're at the sharp end of this and the thoughts that you have um, given to us and shared with us and the thought that you've obviously put into this question um, outside of this committee process has been really um, good to see. So I thank you all for your time. Um, and uh, please be assured if we have questions, we will be darkening your, your door. If something crosses your mind, um, please reach out to, to uh, St Stacy or, or Leanne. I think you have had uh, uh, emails um, shared with with, with 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 you but once again thank you all very very much for your time um for the committee i'm going to suggest we come back at four uh, at four fifth fifty that's a sort of 15 minute break um it'll give me time to fill my teacup again um and we'll see you all in about 15 minutes but uh frank andy jared thanks all very much for your time thank you Right. Have a great day.